flames of the ashes The spirits light up the night Looking down the edge of the Now, from the Untold Radio Network It's Untold Radio AM With Doug and Alan Tychek I got busted drinking. <laughs> God, I'm thirsty today. You know why? Why? I ate pizza this afternoon. Yeah. Just oh, dehydrate yeah. you. It does. It's terrible. Anyhow, hello, Alex. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome, live audience. And uh, today we have what? Uh, Steve Barcello on. Yes. For our big guest. That'd be awesome. Steve was once the mayor of Littleton, North Carolina. Yeah, now he owns the uh, Cryptozoology are Museum. You, are you okay again? Yeah, I'm fine. You've been kind of really quiet lately. Did someone yell at you for talking too loud? Uh, no. No, nobody ever yells at me. Why, why are you whispering? <laughs> you don't need I'm a whisper. whispering. Yeah, you're whispering. Anyhow, um, let's see here. What do we got? What do we got? Oh, I just I had a crazy day. Um, oh, I watched a really kind of weird Bigfoot movie. You know, while I'm working, I'll always usually have like the TV on. Do you do that? Yeah, sometimes I'll do yeah. that. Yeah, it just kind of keeps you company or whatever. Exactly. And if it's really good, yeah, it might suck away a little more of your time because you're you know you're listening and you're looking. But there was a the most Bigfoot, non-Bigfoot. Okay, it was the best Bigfoot movie that was not a Bigfoot movie. Interesting. Tell me it's, more. It's called The Dark Divide. And it's about a trek across the Gifford Pinshaw National Forest. About a 100-mile trip. In the quest for looking for butterflies. That's what the movie is based on. And, of course, what do you think happens when you walk through the wilderness 100 miles alone? You run into Bigfoot. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what happened, yeah. But it's not like the killer Bigfoot or the, you know, it's not a horror movie, okay? So if you want to watch it, it's not a horror movie. It's just a kind of a human drama. And it's based on a true story. So the guy, the, um, the actor is David Cross, who's a comedian. Comedian and an actor. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. Um, it's got, uh, who else is in it? Uh, Deborah Messing from Will and Grace. Okay, yeah. Yeah, she's good. She's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. So anyhow, she plays um, his wife. And I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but yeah, check it out. It's on um, Amazon. I believe it's called the, oh God, I can't remember the title. The Dark Divide. Yeah, I believe the dark divide. Let me look. I think I can see it uh, in my notes. Anyhow, he's going from um, like by Cougar area, which is the nearest town to the Gifford National, Gifford Pinchon National Forest. And then he walks all the way to the Columbia Gorge or the Columbia Gorge. The River Gorge. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And I've, you know, I was interested because obviously I've camped out there quite a few times. I've had Bigfoot experience where the Skookum cast was gotten. So, yeah, it's cool. It wasn't a violent no, no. killer movie. No, you can watch it with, well, maybe not. But yeah, you can, you can watch it in mixed company. All right, moving on. Um, Kind of a weird thing that happened yesterday. So I'm sitting around just doing my, you know, doing my normal work. And I got this call from New York. And they didn't leave a message. And and then they called again. And this time they left a message, but more like a pocket message. You ever heard those? You know, someone pocket dials you and you kind of hear a muffled. You don't know what they're saying. Yeah. Pocket so it was like message. that. Then it happened again, same thing, kind of a pocket dial 
I'm like, what the hell is going on? Finally, I get a text. goes, we have bike delivery for you today in one hour. And I'm like, what? <laughs> We're in a blizzard. Oh, I mean, it's in a blizzard. Yeah. You know, well, you know. Yeah. Oh, I know. All oh, about you know. It. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Anyhow. So, um, wait, wait. He's supposed to be an hour out. And I'm like, oh, I told the, the dispatcher. I go, this is the worst possible day you could have picked. Like out of the entire year. Yeah, the whole pick worst day to deliver a, an old motorcycle. It's an old antique motorcycle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not it's like not worth that much, but it's rare. Um, but anyhow, make a long story short, eventually pulls up like two and a half hours late. Oh, geez. He pulls up and the whole truck and trailer are destroyed. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm not joking. Trailer, 55 foot long trailer, wrecked. Wrecked. Gone. Truck, wrecked. And I'm thinking, what? He didn't drive here cross country in this. Yeah, what happened? With this kind of damage all over it. So I walk out there, get my shoes on. I walk out there, I meet the driver, and he is disgusted. He goes, I totaled out my truck and trailer about three blocks from here. <laughs> so he drives cross country and then he hits black ice uh -huh. under the snow. It had rained, remember? Yeah. And it was snow on or, or ice. He hits a jackknifes the whole rig. And this is a huge rig. Like this was way bigger than a semi trailer. You know how long a semi is, right? Oh, yeah. Like this is 55 foot long, just the trailer. And he jackknifed it. Huge. All crunched it all up and he goes i don't know if there's anything left of your bike <laughs> and i'm thinking he goes it's up front and i look and the whole front's all smashed joe was over because i had to have somebody help me try to push it up so he pops the door open it's completely unscathed by one inch there's shrapnel above the wreckage missed it by one inch right yeah, but here's here's but here's the twist on the story. The whole bike is covered with four leaf clovers. Oh my gosh! That's the logo. It's an OSA, and their logo is a four leaf clover. So it's on the seat, on the gas cap, on the tank. It's just everywhere. It's on the bolts. Yeah, there it is. OSA. So there you go. So you got a, uh, you got so I bought an old 52 year old Osa. <laughs> People look at me like, what do you need that for? You don't need that. Sounds pretty cool. It's a work of art. It's old. It needs love, but it's a work of art. They used to make film projectors <clears throat> and the cam and cameras. And in World War II, they just said, hey, let's make motorcycles. Yeah, there you go. That's that a sweet that's what, bike. That's what mine will look like. Hopefully. Got it? It's a work of art. It's from 1970. That's a 72. Nice. That's all fiberglass. Nice. Tank. That thing. Anyhow, yeah, that's enough of that. I'm sure nobody's interested. It was my story that was interesting. That's crazy to get that far, and it's really well. Yes, that was the fact. The whole everything's crunched except the bike, right? And the fact it's got four leaf clovers all over it. <laughs> That's the That's story. I mean, it's a true high check tale. I'm sorry, <clears throat> I can't make this crap up. Anyhow, <laughs> apparently they work. Let me get a sip. They here. do. That pizza is trying to turn me into a mummy. Oh, no. They, they they didn't make mummy movies when you were a kid, but when I grew up, <clears throat> it was the mummy, mummy this, mummy that, mummy this, mummy everything. Everything was a mummy. We had our mummy movies. No, you didn't. You don't remember with Brendan Fraser? 
Oh, okay. You had one. Oh, when I was a oh, kid. Oh, no. They did like when four When I was a of kid, they babies. ran a mummy movie every day, and you could watch a mummy movie every single day of the week, right? Yeah. And then when it wasn't that one, it was Dracula. It's like, yeah, why are mummies scary? I don't know. All right, moving on. We can do a little news, got a little bit. Um, <clears throat> did you hear they had a complete, successful transplant of a pig kidney into a living human? No. And apparently everything's successful. This is the, apparently, this is a trial. Now listen to this. It's called Xeno transplantation. Xeno transplantation. That's when you take an animal part and put it in you. Comes part to you. So are they going to do more of this? Well, yeah, obviously it's a trial. I mean, obviously to either get pig organs, then it would be human organs. Yeah. It's a you know, huge short supply. So what they're doing is they're doing something with gene splicing to um, get the rejection and the renal failure down very low. For like kidneys and things. Gosh, can you imagine having a pig kidney? Yep. So they're taking um, sixty-nine genomic. They're making sixty-nine genomic edits. They're editing. How are they editing it? Like it's CRISPR. They literally can see the genes and they just cut them and take them out and put new one in. Wow. It's called CRISPR. It's done visually. That's incredible. Yeah. So anyhow, <clears throat> anyhow, I'm going to definitely stop eating bacon. No <laughs> longer am I going to eat any bacon. Can't do it. Think about it. Yeah, well, especially if you have that kidney, how do you eat bacon after that? It saves well, you your can. life. But the point is, pigs are very close to humans. They are. Which is scary. Which is why a lot of cultures don't eat pork. Okay, now for that, um, three boys aged 11, 12, and 16 had robbed a Wells Fargo bank. That's kind of young and started robbing banks, right? Yeah. 11 and 12. 11 years old. 16 year old, okay, whatever. 11 and 12. <laughs> yep, they handed the tell. All they did was hand him a note. You know, and they forked over the money. <laughs> the, and they they oh, called this gang the Little Rascals. The Little Rascals? Yes. And now they're facing second-degree felony charges. Jeez. Yep. This was in Houston. What, did they think they were playing Grand Theft Auto Five? I Yeah. Well, that's part of the problem. Right. There's a lot of pretty crazy video games now, you know? And if you can't separate reality from fiction, you're in deep doo-doo. You are. Okay. Um, a woman who just, w just wanted to watch a live stream of a funeral became a viral sensation after she accidentally left the camera on. Something I heard somebody else did. I'm not going to say who. Somebody in our podcast network, <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Left the uh, camera on after the podcast was over, right? Yeah. Anyhow, so she leaves the camera on, then she took a shower and streamed her shower right into the funeral. Oh, no. Yeah. And it was on a big screen in the funeral. <laughs> a big screen? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yep, and, you know, so that <clears throat> person got a pretty hot send-off there, didn't he? <laughs> Just for them. I thought it was funny. Can happen, though, right? Yeah. We're all human. Um, and then on March 20th, March has been a lot of weird news. On March 20th, a 34-year-old man went to the hospital with abdominal pains. This is in China. This could only happen in China. I hope it couldn't happen here. So he's got severe abdominal cramps. So he goes to the hospital. And so the doctors take an x-ray and an ultrasound. 
and they see something unusual in his abdomen. So they start operating, right? Emergency surgery. Mm -hmm. And they discover a big eel in his, alive in the stomach. What is that from eating? Well, it wasn't in his stomach. Sorry. Sorry. I'll just let you guys just imagine whatever you want now. <laughs> whatever you want. You just go there. I don't care. Anyhow. So you can just take that? as many wild guesses as all that eel got into his yeah. human being as you want. What does that it's happen? Just like, I don't. Gosh, it's like whatever. That's it. There's so much news, I don't want to cover any of it. We all know what it is, right? Yes. The bridge and the this and the that. Oh, my and the gosh. Yeah, I guess now there's that. a huge explosion happening, is going on right now. Another big one in Kentucky. So, I don't know. That's what I heard rumors of. Um, let's see here. Anyhow, let's do some trivia. All right. Can I I know you're. I know you're all excited that you like. I'm ready for it. Can we do the bumper? Yeah, do it. Let her fly. See, you have to be on the hot seat. It's just you. Oh, boy. Okay, but you can throw up uh, photo two. Throw photo two up. That'll make you feel a little... A little smaller. There you go. Don't you feel better now? Yeah. Being all alone, but small. So what do you think I'm going to do trivia on? What do you think this is? Uh, is that a, like a lock? It is a lock. We are going to do trivia on locks. We use them every day. Right? Some more than others. But people know nothing about them. Most people don't. Some do. But most people don't really know the history of locks, right? <laughs> and I know you, there's no way you do. Well, Did I teach you the history of locks when you were a kid? No, I missed out on that lesson. Yeah, so what we're going to do is just talk about mechanical locks. Okay. So when do you think the oldest known mechanical lock date, dated back to 500 years ago? Thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, or four thousand years ago. We're talking a mechanical lock. Four thousand? Yeah, it was four thousand. Super old. Yeah, it is. What do you think they used before they had mechanical locks? Mm, <laughs> a stick. <laughs> a stick. Yeah, people, please play along in chat there. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Lay got it right. So you, the idea is to beat Alex. I mean, that's the whole idea. So what did they use before mechanical locks? Mary Jo says a big rock. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been my Jason second. Jason got yeah. it right. She got 4,000 years. Anyhow, so before locks, they used mainly rope, believe it or not. That makes sense. Yeah, rope. They had some kind of Gordian knots that they could tie up there. Anyway, we'll get more into that. All right. Um, so what was the largest padlock ever that, ever that ever existed? The largest padlock. When I was a kid, I remember I got um, or I saw a small padlock, like a miniature one my mom had. I wanted that lock so damn bad. I had a key and everything. And I begged her for that, and she gave it to me. That was like one of my pride possessions. Was that little padlock? I just so, did. An, I just did an inside <laughs> fizzy ice mountain with pizza burp. Inside. So largest lock. Yeah. What was the largest padlock ever made? Mm. <clears throat> in feet, pounds. and I can, you know, I don't even want to give you multiple choice on this one. Just whoever gets the closest. Jason says a hundred pounds. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred pounds. 
All right, that's enough time. It was 916 pounds, 56 inches tall, 41 inches wide. So five feet tall, about. What are you going to use with that thing? I don't know. Bad lock up something. You're, hopefully, you've reached a rich guy's door. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. You know how there's always some giant crap along the highway? Yeah. I swear to God, I was in Litchfield, and they have the biggest ball of yarn there. And the guy I was doing business with goes, D -d -d you got to stop in and see the big ball of yarn. You didn't get your photo with the big ball of yarn? No, it was closed. It's inside. Uh, they were closed. I was going to. Okay, Egyptians yeah, um, created the first pin locks, right? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I believe that is a, yeah, that's a pin lock um, that we have up there. So when was the first pin locks done? Was it 2,000, 3,000, or 4,000 years ago by the Egyptians? Mm, it took three, a grown person. 3, down, three Was it 3,000? Are you cheating? Are you cheating? I mean, I wish. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Again, it's two in a row. That's impossible. He's cheating. Mary Jo got it, right? Mary Jo's cheating. <laughs> Lori. Lori Barnes got it. <laughs> Nixon got it right. Jake got it right. See, they're all copying me. Yeah, okay. So uh, skeleton key, we've all heard that term, right? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so how do you think that term came about? How did it come about? Yeah, how did the term skeleton key come about? Oh, because it was made out of a skeleton. What do you mean a skeleton? Like, you know, like a bone. Oh, no, no. No. It says there's many theories about skeleton keys and how they got their name, but the truth is that skeleton keys, which are just master keys, yeah. Are capable of working many locks. So apparently they're apparently stripped down from like all of their essential parts just to the skeleton of the key. Mm. So. All right. Lock technology in ancient Rome. So um, apparently 2,000 years after the Egyptian lock and key, Ancient Romans advanced locking, advanced locking technology using steel, right? Mm -hmm. So apparently the Egyptians used wood and that kind of stuff. And they created the first pin tumbler locks with a steel spring, capable of opening doors from only one side. So Roman locks were far more intricate than the Egyptian predecessors and Roman locks and keys were fashioned from iron and bronze. So that's kind of interesting. That's not trivia. It's just facts. Um, All right. Trivia though. What famous magician was a locksmith before he became, you know, went into magic full time. Anybody know? What famous magician was a locksmith before he became a, ma you know, uh, Houdini? a magician? Pardon? Houdini? Are you are you snooping? I mean, <laughs> everyone's saying Houdini. <laughs> oh, that's what you're looking at. No, 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 no. You need to turn your chat off. Okay, All right. people. We just figured out <laughs> Alex's source of amazing knowledge. He's just reading <laughs> chat. All right, it's off, I promise. You have been, you've, that's what he's doing. <laughs> he's reading your answers, people. So when Ristol goes Houdini, <laughs> he just copies. So we got a lot of, it is Houdini. I have a lot of faith in our listeners. Yes, it was Harry Houdini. You do. Yes, it was. 
Throw up photo three. And what culture invented these unique locks? First one to guess. Come on. Mm. Yeah, Sharon, Alex is so busted. I, I just figured it out. That's what he's doing. He's just looking at your guys' answers. He's reading the chat. Yeah, John Ayers told me. Chinese. Ooh. John got it. First Chinese. to get it right. It's Chinese. Oh, yeah. Look at the yeah, the markings. Yeah. Yep. These are combination locks. They shaped them like animals. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So what year, what year were these made? Just rough. First person to guess the closest. Then like the year 500. 500 what? AD, BC? AD. AD. Okay. 500 is Alex's guess. So how old are these locks up on the... No, how old, John? Don't give me a year. Uh, yeah, I see Dr. Mitchell. 410. I'd say David's the closest. That's 265 AD. These were made. It's mm. a long time ago. Right? 1,800 years? No, oh, yeah. 1,700 years ago. Pretty amazing. Somebody handed me one of those and told me this was made 1,700 years ago. I'd go, no way. <laughs> okay, lock patents skyrocketed in America in what century? And second part to the question we'll get to, but what century did lock patents just skyrocket? I don't know, like the the eighteen hundreds. Well, it was, um, yeah. So lays really close. Seventeen seventy four. Okay. All the way through nineteen twenty. How many patents were filed? Was it five hundred patents, a thousand patents, two thousand patents, or three thousand? during that period between 1774 and 1920? 2,500. 2,500. That's your guess? That wasn't one of the, that wasn't one of the terms or one of the multiple choice questions. So... What were the multiple choice? Just, I didn't know I was getting multiple choice. I said it was 500, 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000. Oh. <laughs> Uh, See, he's just looking. He's sneaking to look at chat. <laughs> 2,000? That was 3,000. Oh. 3,000 patents were filed so during many. that period. That's a lot of patents. Yeah. Just for locks. Okay. Um... Yeah, so anyhow, the answer was the late 18th century. Um, uh, locks in the New World were imported from Europe. So apparently America didn't make any. Everything came from Europe, and then we started making locks. When was the first lock smith company formed? Was it 1920, 1907, or 1868? First locksmith company. You said 1920. 1907 or 1868? Uh, eight, 1868. Throw up photo four. Photo four. There you go. So it was the um, Yale and Town Manufacturing Company that launched the first locksmith company in 1868. And they're still in business, right? 
Um, no, they they closed their doors in two thousand one. <laughs> Kaput! Ouch. They lasted a long time, though, man. Yeah, that's a long time. It's like, why? Why do you quit? You know, you you struggle to be in business that many years, and you just go, ah, screw it, <laughs> screw it. I don't know. Okay, there was one lock developed. We're almost done. There was one combination lock developed in 1862 that had one million, or excuse me, one trillion, 73 billion, 741 million combinations that you could, then it would take combos to get it right, right? This is done in 1862. Had that many combos. How many years would it take you to open it? Just trying each, you know, each number, each sequence. Would it take 100 years, 300 years, 1,000 years, or 2,000 years to open 1, it by how How many? 1,000. 1,000 is Alex's guess. Laurie says, Alex, you need to start looking at the ceiling during trivia. <laughs> Laurie says, a thousand years. Everybody's pretty much guessing a thousand years. Actually, it would take 2,000 years just constantly trying every combo wow. to open the lock developed in 1862. It's impressive. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. That's real impressive. Yeah, actually, the exact answer is 2,042 years. So eventually you would, you know, run out of combos. Yeah. You'd have to be able to open it. I mean, it could open earlier if you got lucky. But definitely after 2,042 years, it would open. Yep, and that was patented in 1862. Um, by the way, Fort Knox, the combination on that lock changes daily. And it's pretty sweet. Yeah, how much gold do you think is in there, Fort Knox? 2,000 pounds. <laughs> 2,000 pounds of gold? Is that a lot? Is that like nothing? I have no idea. I don't know. Yeah, apparently they uh, change their lock daily. It's three hundred billion about in gold. It's not that much. No. Whatever. Need more. All right, let's go on to Doug's clips. I hit the bumper. You can hit the bumper. Alex likes bumpers. Go ahead. <laughs> There we go. That was a good bumper, Alex. Bumping away. Clip one. Okay, the sound is fine. Have you ever heard of giant squirrels, Alex? Yes. You did not. I've heard of giant squirrels. Really? Tell me about tell all, tell our entire <laughs> audience about your knowledge of giant squirrels. Please. They're really, really big. They're big. Okay. Yeah, I'm impressed. 30 pounders. 30 pounders. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, go ahead, and, go ahead and play clip one and we'll all be experts. Go ahead. And... All right, let's do it. I took a friend of mine out golfing over the weekend, and there is a golf course here in Orlando that has the biggest squirrels anyone's ever seen. I swear, they're the size of a small dog. They look like raccoons or otters. If you're from Orlando, you know it. You know the area, Rio Pinar. It's a great course. The squirrels crack me up every time. They will take snacks out of your bag. They'll come up to you as you're trying to hit a ball. It's crazy. Check that button, bad boy out. You ever seen a squirrel like that, Alex? Yeah, that looks like a 30-pounder. Have you ever seen a squirrel like that? No. No, I haven't. These are fox squirrels. They're kind of rare. They're um, <clears throat> protected now. They live in Georgia and some of the southern states, but there's not many of them. They're kind of cool. 
Does it? Apparently, they, they're quite aggressive, these golfers. All right, I'll go over here for a second. You can't even concentrate. That's a fox squirrel. All right, that's enough of that. Crap. Okay, clip two. We don't need any sound. Once again, I just, I like these clips. Found another one. <clears throat> this is a meteorite or meteor coming in, right? A bullite. But please explain this. Go ahead and play it. No sound. The reason there's no sound is because there's so much swearing. You know, what the, you know, what the, what the, every five seconds. Oh, yeah. You don't need to hear it. You can, you can give them one blast just for a second and then you get turned right down. So watch this thing breaks up, and this is where I don't understand. They'll just kind of stop, they'll meander, and then they'll start moving around, going up and down, and. This guy's got his little green laser there. He thinks he's going to communicate with them. So they're almost gone, right? Mm -hmm. Let's keep watching. Nothing worse than somebody with a laser. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> Here they come again. Just look. Wow. Now, obviously, it's not a meteorite, right? Meteors just fall. They don't revive. They don't come no. back to life. What in the world? I really would like some serious comments in the comments on this. There may be an explanation, but I do not know it. And people, yeah, fireworks. <clears throat> not an explanation. I've seen these myself. You can watch them for hours. If we had a some kind of little gunpowder mechanism that could burn for hours, that'd be really very heavy. And these definitely come from way up. Nixon says he's mystified. Are you mystified, Alex? Yeah. I'll Eric says it's that. bizarre. But anyhow, there's a lot of these. And I've seen them myself. It's kind of nuts. I've seen I've seen these so close to my car with the spark trails. You think you're in a Buck Rogers movie. <laughs> They're like orbs. Just picture an orb with a sparking tail, and then you'll you'll kind of get this. But <clears throat> nobody knows what orbs are, right? We have no clue. Yeah. All right, that's enough. Clip three, <clears throat> no sound. This is a footage of a real shapeshifter. This is the northern white owl. I know you're an owl expert, right, Alex? Mm-hmm. Yep. You knew that. And it shape shifts when it feels threatened. Look at them. Just watch this. Look at the crazy things it can do. You can get real skinny, real tall, real fluffy. <laughs> there you go. Very cool. Did you think that was cool? I did. You did? Okay. I did. I'm skeptical. As Joe would say, I remain skeptical. <laughs> okay. Um, clip four. Um, let's just go ahead and let it play. And it's, I just find it I'm in the TV business. And this is kind of an interesting thing is to say, I don't know if everything he's saying is true, but I found it real interesting and he related in a good way of kind of what's going on with TV right now. You know, the networks and uh, putting out shows. So go ahead and play it with sound. The American entertainment industry is dying. I struggled about making this post, but I think it's time for me to voice what's really happening behind the scenes in Hollywood. A lot of people have been asking me, well, Patrick, what's your next project? What's your next project? And I'll be honest with you, I haven't worked since spring of last year and there has been no project since. After I wrapped my last show, Fight to Survive, and we saw the strikes looming for the writers, 
we thought, okay, this will be a lot like 07, 08. Since reality or unscripted television is typically non-union, we usually pick up the slack when the unions, like the Writers Guild and the Actors Guild, are doing their negotiations. And we expected this to happen last year, but it didn't. Since studios are run by corporations now, as opposed to executives who used to champion shows or support creativity or the artistry behind making television, that's just not how it goes anymore. It's slashing budgets across the board. From what I understand, the networks have simply run out of money. They all tried to adopt the Netflix streaming platform, get rid of advertisers, and work on just solely a subscription-based model, and that just killed revenue streams. In short, there's no money to make television shows anymore, or at least not in the United States. We've seen a lot of outsourcing out of the country. There's actually a show that's going to be about San Francisco Asian gangs. They filmed it in Cape Town, South Africa. San Francisco is just 300 miles north of LA. Some people think this is revenge from the corporations for workers actually trying to unite and get what they want. But no matter what the explanation is, there's just simply no work out there. And it is crushing entertainment workers. You gotta remember, some are blue collar workers, just regular middle class folks trying this to This explains why I'm doing legend science, science all on my own. And while it's always been a hustle, I've never struggled yeah. to find work in my entire career. I'm freelancing in other ways to make ends meet. However, some people that are really close to me, some extremely talented, creative people, I'm hearing horror stories of. And these are people that are my bosses, my mentors, the people that never have a hard time finding work. I got off the phone yesterday with another executive who told me that she's doing DoorDash and selling her inherited grandmother's jewelry to make ends meet. There's producers and unscripted workers who are out there doing Uber every day. One of the most talented editors I know just told me that he's selling his place and moving out of California. And then I've even heard of a suicide because that's how bad it is right now. There's really not much of a voice for our industry. So that's why I'm making this TikTok to get the word out there. And I've spoken to a lot of other producers and a lot of us are truly wondering that out of all these years, this is where our career ends. That's it. That sounds brutal. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I, I, I'm in touch with a lot of people and it's not much out there, you know. So I'm planning, planning once we get alleged mean science done, to take advantage of a lot of these professionals and start doing some really good cryptid shows. So That'd be awesome. That's one of the reasons I put it up there. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, not that people feel sorry for people in Hollywood, but it's still, it's the state. You know, everybody's kind of in the same boat. Mm-hmm. Um, clip five. Sound is okay. Go ahead and play the sound. This is supposedly a billionaire just received the first ornithopter. You know what an ornithopter is? It's like an airplane that flies with, you know, like uh, the way birds fly or a hummingbird would fly or a dragonfly, right? Yeah. And this is completely fake. I mean, someone posted this as it's real, like, oh, yeah, they're going to be delivering these in, you know, 2025. But I, I show it. It almost had me going for just a few minutes until this scene, and that's when I knew it was fake. You know, there was just stuff I knew that was they couldn't quite get the smoke right right no they got it screwed up somebody said there was like something like this in Dune the movie yeah Dune. is there I think there is yeah I haven't yeah. seen the second one it would be cool though because you know good dragonflies I mean they do fly amazing yeah. You know, they hover, they stop on a dime, they can choo, just go right, left, 90 degree turns. So, anyhow, it's fake. We know it's fake. So, I throw it out there. Let's um, have one last little, just one clip. There's kind of a new trend going on all over the internet right now where husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, Alex, you and yeah, you and he'll say need to try this. It's just something fun to do. Just get a pen and paper or a bunch of paint or whatever and paint each other. 
Oh, that'd be hilarious. Then show each other what you painted. <laughs> you know, give it give it a good college try, right? And so go ahead and play this. This is just one example of the results. Go ahead and play it. Okay. And uh, we got Steve in the background. Oh, so. awesome. All right. What is this? Sound is good. Play, turn it up. Not playing. Oh. <laughs> you ready? No. So he's going to show her his painting. I know. Are this gonna, is how. Are you, you going to show it on the video first? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, I mean the average person doesn't have any right. art talent right this is kind of I, the glasses are really hard to do but here you go this is kind of you <laughs> her reaction's priceless Can't breathe. She's gonna, she's gonna have the big one. Oh my goodness! I told you. Oh my it's god! Contagious. What's wrong? I got your neck. It's pretty bad. Yeah, <laughs> I got your neck and everything. It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. It He's like convinced it's perfect. Okay. That's enough. Oh my god. Okay. Last bumper. All right. Tech breakdown. We're gonna do our is. technological breakdown, and then we're gonna get Steve on here. Let's do it. There you are. Another happy bumper played by Alex. Okay. So last week we talked about stealth ports, little magnetic ports you can install in your tent, right? Mm -hmm. This is a similar thing, but different. Okay. This is about a porthole you don't need to open, but you can see through it and it's not clear. What would it be? Okay. So um, we're going we're gonna to show you. Hold on here. So the nice thing is with this kind of porthole is there's no opening anything, but you need a thermal camera. So if you have a thermal camera and you go camping and you're too, just like me, too afraid to open the zipper with the big zipper sound and spook what's ever out there you're walking in your campground, <clears throat> you're definitely going to want to do this. And, <clears throat> man, I'm just totally shouldn't eat that pizza. Um, okay, so what you're going to need is a, um, a thermal cam and some low-density polyurethane. Do you know what low-density polyurethane is? What it's used for? Is that like for trash bags? Yes, trash bags. <laughs> He's guilty because <laughs> I told him the answer. <laughs> That's why he looks guilty. He can, Alex is like the most honest person ever. <laughs> okay, so um, go ahead and just throw it up. But this, but obviously you can get thinner ones. So yeah. the, we're going to show you how you can do this very easy, really nice, do a nice, neat job, and how good it works. I'm gonna, we're we're going to show you. Um, Eric Sorensen, who is one of the tech guys for Legend Meet Science, we actually tested it just for you so you can see, and it's something you can implement yourself. Um, so we're experimenting with it. Let's go ahead and show that first, and then I'll tell you how to do it really nice in your tent. Okay. 
So you see the no, the low density uh, poly at the bottom is used. No mm -hmm. poly. It's just, you know, the camera out in the open. Also, do you notice the black? The dude's not wearing sunglasses. That's just glasses. Thermal cams do not penetrate glass. So you can't um, use like Lexane or polycarbonate glass or any kind of clear glass or real glass. Thermal camera will not film through it. That's so that cool. It blocks out. Yeah, I don't know why. but so, so, but look at the bottom. That's filming through a trash bag, a three mil, real heavy duty one too. So I think, you know, you can get them one mil, two mil, and three mil. They may even have them four mil. Obviously, the idea you could camouflage your camera. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's really. You, I mean, you could put a thermal camera in a trash bag with trash in it, and leave it in the you know in your camp. Put cans in it. Put a bunch of trash. Put a thermal camera. It just it's invisible to a thermal camera. I mean, do you see the detail differences? It's a little bit. Yeah, it's like fifteen percent, ten percent difference. Okay. Can, so. All right. So this this is a trick you can do. God, don't do it with your really expensive, like five hundred dollar tent, six hundred dollar mm -hmm. tent, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Go get a cheap Walmart one, a two man, four man cheap one. You know, go spend fifty bucks on a tent specifically for this purpose. That's what I would recommend. But all you're gonna need um, is the following. You can even leave that picture up if you want. Hang on. For some reason, all my notes disappeared. Not that I can't remember. Hang on. Let me go up. There we go. All right. So you're going to need to gather the following. One, get a milk jug cap. <clears throat> what, what are you going to do with that? That's what you're going to trace a hole, you know, to make a nice oh, round yeah. hole. Get a Sharpie. Any color. Get a three-inch bowl or a coffee cup, something bigger than the, the milk jug cap, like at least twice as big. Get some clear silicone, you know, in the caulking tube um, or one of those small tubes, or get some shoe goop or fabric goop or any kind of fabric adhesive. Mm -hmm. You're going to need a, a, you know, a three mil garbage or a trash bag. For Normally look for contractor trash bags they're going to be three mil and once again this is low density meaning the molecules are very far apart but it's still waterproof water still can't get in it no bugs are going to get in it um it'll pretty much keep everything on and it completely hides you so if it's in your tent right so we're just talking about tents right now but man i'll tell you once you know this and I'm, I'm sure some of you researchers that are veterans know about this. And maybe I've never done anything with it, with that knowledge. Now's your time to actually do something. Take some action. So um, you're also going to need 120 grit sandpaper. You're going to need a Dixie cup for the cement. You're going to need a half inch wide cheap paintbrush that you can just throw away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, you can get a whole bag of really nice paintbrushes on like Amazon for hobby work. They always have a half inch one in there. Um, okay. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to find, you're going to go in your tent, set it up, find a one in 1.5 inch, um, uh, cap, like I mentioned, go inside the tent and find an area that you would most likely sleep in your sleeping bag, where you could get to that that opening, right, that hole that's going to be covered with this trash bag, where you're going to make the least amount of noise. So figure out the most likely place, and definitely recommend putting one on each side of the tent. You know, I definitely recommend, too, if you're doing Bigfoot research, don't sleep in your tent alone. Try to you know, join up with somebody so you can cover both sides of the tent, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you know just trace it on there, then take the tent down, cut it out. Then you're gonna want to cauterize the edges. I mean, I've used everything from you can use a bic lighter by just flashing it. 
you could use a heat gun or just heat up a like a screwdriver and just cauterize the nylon so it doesn't fray. Or you could even do hot glue. Just something to keep the dent from fraying. And if you're really good, you could sew around it. That'll stop it. You fold it, you know, cut it, then fold it open, and then sew it so it's double stitched. So you could do that too. Okay. Then um uh, basically you're just going to want to take that and, and now you've got your hole cut out and you've got to cauterize, take your coffee cup, your bowl, trace that because you need a bigger area where the garbage bag or the polyurethane, polyethylene will be uh, glued to it. So you need gluing surface. So that's why the bigger, the coffee cup. So you only need a one and a half inch for the camera for filming with your thermal camera and looking through with your thermal camera. And then you need a bigger area of three inch to glue the trash bag on. I recommend you rough it up. Polyurethane or po excuse me, polyethylene is the hardest thing, hardest plastic or polymer to glue. It just naturally resists glue. So you need to rough it up. Um, um and that's why you need like a gooey like silicone or whatnot. And then simply brush on all the silicone only on the fabric and that within that round circle around the other smaller circle. And then take your um, circle you've already cut out, the plastic that's already pre-cut that matches the exact diameter of the coffee cup, and then just carefully lay it on there and push it because you want a pro-looking job, right? And from the inside now. So you haven't done anything with the outside. So from the outside, if you have um, if you have a yellow tent, well, you're going to have a dark circle on it. Um, and that you're going to have to live with. But if you could find a darker tent, like a br dark brown, it's going to be less noticeable. I don't think they're going to be afraid of a round, dark circle on a tent. Would you think so, Alex? No. So then anyhow, just glue the plastic on there, push it. Maybe put some book weights on it until it dries. You know, give it 10, 12 hours. Because once again, polyethylene is a tough item to glue. And then don't try to stretch it. Just leave it alone. It'll it'll stay there. You can always bring a roll of emergency duct tape if you ever need to to duct tape a hole in your tent. Um, duct tape is so sticky it sticks. And yeah, I suppose you could probably duct tape this on too, the plastic. Right. You could a square instead of a circle. You know, I just think a circle looks so much better. But if you want to do a square, you could probably just duct tape it on on the inside. Although duct tape doesn't stick real well if it rains. Yeah, if it rains, you're hosed. It's kind of, it doesn't, they're the best in water, right? Um, what does stick well is like carpet tape. But you don't want to peel the, the other side of the wax paper off. Just peel one side off if you're going to use carpet tape. But I would use the glue, the silicone shoe goop. It works really well. It's going to look cool. Um, no one's even going to notice that you have this cool, stealthy. Don't even tell anybody. If you're on an expedition, don't even tell anybody. Because yeah. you now have superpowers. You can now look through that opening, put your thermal cam up to that little opening, and if you get one of our, you know, the um, uh, the miniature ones we recommended here, I think that was that last week, two weeks ago, those little miniature thermal cameras that plug into your phone. Yeah, I think it was last week. Yeah, you can put that on a 10-foot extension cord. You could even tape the thermal camera on over the porthole, and then you're all ready. You don't have to do anything. You just stay in your sleeping bag and monitor every bit of movement. Right? What's so funny? You reading some comment? Yeah, the XH09, Eric. Eric is Eric says. XH09. Yeah, Eric's in the chat. So yeah, yeah this is, polyethylene is hard to glue. Yep. This is cool. Um, I don't think anyone. Yeah, and Eric has mentioned it sewing it in. It does glue, but you got to rough it up with 120 yeah. grit. And maybe you don't want it to be that permanent because, you know, if it's, you maybe want to replace it so you can yank it off. The idea is if it lasts for a, one or two um, trips, then you can just yank it off. I mean, how cheap is garbage? 
garbage bags. Don't right? cost anything. They cost nothing. Um, and I'm sure somebody can improve upon this system. And if you do, get back to us, let us know, and we'll feature it if you figure out a really cool, cool way to do it. Yep. So Eric says the polyethylene works best when it's close to the lens. Yeah, that's why you want to put the camera. I think in this test, he'd actually held it right up to the lens. Just sees right through it. Cool. All right, we're done. That's it. That's all I had this week. All right, so we get Steven on. Yeah, let's bring Steve on. So should we introduce Steve? Yeah. So Stephen Barcello um, was the mayor of Littleton, North Carolina. <clears throat> so apparently um, Steve, I have not met Steve. Steve has got years. And he was involved in journalism. He now runs a really cool museum in Littleton, North Carolina, called the Cryptozoology and Paranormal Museum. Mm -hmm. You know, it covers things like Bigfoot, the paranormal research techniques. He's an avid outdoorsman. He's a Bigfoot researcher and once was the mayor of Littleton, North Carolina. So let's just call him the mayor of cryptozoology, right? Love it. All right, let's bring him on. Hey, Hello, Steve. Steve, how are you? Live? We've never met. Why? Why haven't we met, Steve? I'm not sure. I've uh, followed you for quite a while. I, I guess we're just covering different uh, conferences when we're out there. Yeah. So, how in the world did you get involved in? You know, let's talk about the cryptozoology. But I mean, what 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 caused you to? You know, to obviously change the course of your life. Oh, definitely. Uh, I've got into the paranormal end uh, late in life. Uh, I was traveling. Uh, I used to work at Brookhaven National Laboratory. I was there about 18 years. And on weekends, I would do computer shows. And I, I'm going to date myself here. I was selling shareware. So most people out there probably don't have a clue what that is. It's free software before the Internet was a thing. And it was uh, basically if you liked it, you were supposed to make a donation to the person who wrote the software. Yeah, I remember That's when, that. You remember like when Doom first came out? And, yeah. you know, very basic games. but uh, So I do that on weekends and travel. And I used to drag my uh, oldest daughter, who was like, I mean, probably 11 years old at the time, Holly, with me. And we go up and down the East Coast. And sometimes on the way back, if we had a halfway decent weekend, I would uh, stop at Gettysburg. I just love Gettysburg. I love history. And uh, we got into doing the ghost tours. And I would just call my wife and say, call me in sick, call in Holly sick. We're going to spend an extra day here. We're not going to get out of here till late Monday, you know. And uh, so little by little doing some of the ghost tours there. And uh, we got more into it. And the next, you know, we bought some of our own equipment. My first digital camera way back then, which was expensive for really, really lousy digital images but it was something to have and uh, next thing you know i'm the guy on long island that was telling the story of the haunted lighthouse on halloween to one of the local radio stations little by little got into it but as you wasn't the sort of thing you talk to people about you know people you know how it is people are going to raise their eyebrows like you're you're into what you know and we actually had business cards made up that we created i, I couldn't even tell you the name of the group we started you know it wasn't like it was anything real and that's when meetup was a thing, too. We'd meet up with these people. And uh, this way, if the police stopped us on some property, we didn't look criminal. We just looked like we needed to take our medication. And, uh, but, we, you know, but we actually, a couple of times, we get caught on state property, you know, historic places on Long Island. And the cops are really cool. They're going, what are you doing? And what is this equipment? And they were like, just, you know, like, cool, just be careful, have fun. You know, we never got rousted. And uh, so that's kind of what I did. I always had an interest in watching monster quest and all these other shows and in search of uh always loved the uh doing things with uh, cryptozoology but it didn't exist i'm on long island we're excited to see squirrels everything's so overbuilt Especially, yeah even giant squirrels <laughs> yeah, yeah i don't even see giant squirrels or nor did i ever paint <laughs> you know, I, I paint each other <laughs> but uh uh we, we had a good time we used to go out and do this but uh I was lucky enough working for the New York Daily News later, which is kind of a transition to get into that. 
And uh, I had a really cool boss, and uh, I ended up mentioning to her at a Christmas party about, well, actually one of the other people mentioned that I was into the paranormal and stuff. We got talking, and she gave me the, uh, said, why don't we do something with this, and kind of gave me a budget, and we worked something out. I actually was able to go out now, and anyone who's done ghost hunting, especially previous, back when it was first not super popular, it's like impossible to get onto places and do an investigation. Uh, people just, you know, you know, go home, stop pestering us. Uh, well, once I worked for the daily news, I was able to make phone calls and say, this is Steve Barcello. I'd like to come out and do a documentary on your place, your haunted location. They're like, sure. When do you want to come? And it was like hassle free to get into these places. And I was lucky enough to do a couple of really good pieces for them that did very well. The desk loved it, the uh, uh, stuff we got. And eventually my first Bigfoot piece I did was uh, actually up in Whitehall, New York. Paul, uh, interviewed Paul Bartholomew, who wrote a book. Yeah, and, cool. Uh, it, was, it was super popular. I had a great time. I actually even brought my youngest daughter up with me on that one. And she was a film student at Purchase College. And I figured let her come up and get published and work with me on it. And she had a blast. I mean, she had a great time. We went skiing golf course. We went to uh, interview a whole bunch of people. Uh, Frank Sinecki, who had the, uh, we were the first ones to publish pictures uh, of the newspapers to do a, uh, a piece where he had the picture of that Bigfoot picking apples off the ground, off his apple trees. So, did, so Oh, yeah. did you did you meet Brian Goslin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I oh, went to yeah. Brian's house. And, and actually, oh, no, cool. Brian, I, I'm sorry, Brian I met at the hotel we're at. Oh, and, okay. Uh, so we brought him there. And, uh, yeah, I got to meet a lot of people there. There's a few people I missed, unfortunately. I can't remember the gentleman's name that owned the golf course. He passed shortly before I got there. Bill, Bill, his name was Bill. I met him. I met his wife. Bill had, um, he had, uh, he was a little hard of seeing. Okay. He was somewhat blind, I guess, legally blind. You remember? Um, he yeah. ran the golf course there and he was yeah, I never met him. super nice guy. Yeah. I've, I've, I spent, um, quite a bit of time in Whitehall. Um, what a, what a great place. So did you have any, did, did you go out Bigfooting in, in and Yeah, out? actually Paul took me out on some of the family property and it was kind of daytime and we were more just filming him and he brought us to a bear road the first night we got out there and I thought he was trying to lose me. He was so quick through the roads. <laughs> I trying to keep up with him, but that's when the sign still existed before the sign got stolen. I mean, we did this quite a while ago. Uh, it was like I said, it was my first time doing a, uh, you know, I can't I wouldn't call it an investigation because I'm just doing an interview. But the first time really getting out there and seeing all the prints he had, the castings, and, uh, and Paul was great. He was phenomenal. Um, our phones didn't work. We were stuck in this little motel down the road, which is something like right out of a horror movie itself. And uh, that was crazy. And uh, we literally, I mean, the heat was either on or it was off. So you'd be like dying in the room or you shut it off. It was cold at that time of the year. You'd be freezing. And uh, the, the people that ran the hotel were very sweet. They were funny. I remember even asking him, I said, is there a place around here where you can, I can pick up like a six pack of beer or something? I'm working on the computer. Of course, the Internet didn't work for nothing. And uh, they come out of the back room with all these assorted bottles they found in the rooms that uh, the hunters left. You could have these. It's like, oh, I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> I don't know who recapped what, you know, but we had we had a good time. And uh, the I have a feeling. I have a feeling. Mean you could swap Whitehall stories for a day. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got a bunch oh, and of we were up there right after Finding Bigfoot was there, mm. and I was hearing stories about them and like uh, Bobo stealing bacon off people's plates and stuff like that. <laughs> we didn't use that in the story, but it was a lot of fun. It was just yeah. You know, we so okay, but 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 it was but it was journalism that got you involved in this whole. Yeah, well, I was into it before, but that gave me the gateway to actually go out right. and do this stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it I gave me the to excuse to get out in the woods, get out with people, right. meet other exactly. witnesses, blah, blah, blah. And take it much more seriously. Well, when in the world did you get um, the gumption to open a museum? I mean, that's well, a big that step. That's after I moved down to North Carolina. I was escaping New York and high taxes and tolls, and anyone from up north kind of knows mm. that. And uh, the New York Daily News, uh, at that point, uh, new management came in. Our, our situation as far as a job changed. And I could have stayed there. I guess stuck it out, but they were cutting back hours. And I, you know, I just said, the heck with this. I was kind of done. And uh, so I started just traveling, looking for a location. I was pretty much going up and down the East Coast. Uh, I didn't want to be near the water coming from Long Island. I was done with flooding and issues like that. 
And somehow I found this town of Littleton, North Carolina, where 360 some feet above sea level. I bought this big old historic house, relatively cheap, needed work. And I didn't know if we were going to stay there, but I figured if nothing else, it's a stepping stone out of New York. It was getting us out. And then eventually we got rid of the house in New York and stuff like that. But I came down here. Now I have an interest in this. I'm not telling everybody that, but people can look me up and see what I've done in the past and some of these pieces. And uh, next thing I know, we end up with paranormal activity in the house. Now I'm into this, my wife, not at all. And uh, so we have an underground stream in the basement of the house, things like that. Uh, it's an old historic place, 1850s at least. Uh, so I'm kind of taking advantage of that. We're having fun. My oldest daughter, once again, was into this with me. Uh, next thing I know, I'm hearing about Bigfoot sightings in the area. Now we have the Hollow Ossipone tribe down below us uh, about, they're probably around 18, 19 miles, uh, but b uh, just above them is Medoc Mountain State Park. And that's the first place I actually found prints personally. And uh, so all these sightings are coming through. So what do I do? My background in journalism, I start interviewing people and filming them. And from that point, it just kind of took off. And I got, had more and more people coming forward. And uh, so after a while, kind of we just started having people come to the house. And then the front of the house, it's a big home, uh, had like the two, uh, the vestibule and two large rooms up front. It became the place I staged people. And eventually, I just started putting items that I've collected along the way. And little by little, it became sort of a museum and then eventually we turned it into an actual museum actually having more displays and we i started more hardcore collecting things like you know we had a lot of haunted dolls given to us uh caskets i mean you name it across the board oh, and then I, I was collecting prints and so i had some castings in there and i've got quite a good selection here at this point and uh, Steve, of course Steve, then, you, could you loan alex a haunted doll sure yeah yeah that's just what he wants yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll ship one over to you, just creepy like, you know. <laughs> yeah, real creepy one. You can put it in his room. We actually find stuff left at the door here at the museum. I'll come show up here, and there'll be a bag there, and there'll just be a, a, a usually a doll, but some, we've had some pretty creepy things delivered to us. So, like, uh, we've uh, I've got a, a monkey head. It's a uh, it's a piece from uh, a gentleman. God actually came to the museum, said he was going to ship it to us. He could drop it off. And we end up getting this monkey has a ceremonial piece you're supposed to wear around your head. It's from a tribe that used to do head hunting, and they no longer uh, dispatch humans. They just do monkeys. And this okay, is okay, okay. Yeah. So we get I'm some. Sorry, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> but we get a lot of odd stuff. Yeah, it sounds like it. So, okay, well, let's talk Bigfoot. Um, sure. Obviously, that's what our audience is most interested. What is the... You know, what's what's a story that really maybe cemented your belief in the creature? Uh, Did you I hear say, anything? Sure. We've, uh, it was a woman, unfortunately, she's passed since, Minnie Silver. She's one of the elders with the uh, Halawasa Pony tribe down the road. And I actually met her son first, and he was uh, a retired military. And he told me about a sighting he had when he was 14 years old down in that area back then it was all dirt roads for the most part and he was down by fishing creek one of the rivers that goes through medoc mountain and basically uh, a place his mother told him not to go and he was down there with his uh, on a bicycle and he was by this river by a bridge and he heard movement and thought it was going to be a buck or something walking out and this large bigfoot walks out by the river stares up at him and this is the cool part he said it had the most dark blue eyes and his eyes stared up at him. He just kind of stares down. He's a 14-year-old boy, freaks out. Now, he's kind of in a low spot because this is where the river is. Says the heck with his bike and leaves it and runs all the way home. And he says, this is when he goes to his mother and explains what happened, what he saw. And instead of her, his mother being surprised, she said, this is why I told you not to go down there. He puts him in the car. They drive down and they retrieve his bike. And this when he started hearing stories from his mother about all the things that they knew about and didn't really want to talk about. Uh, this is a, shortly after that, I got to meet his mom and then she came up and we were doing festivals and she act, I actually got her to come to some of the festivals and talk, but she had the most amazing stories. Uh, and they one time uh, drove me around down there and showed me locations where uh, some of these things happened back in the day. Now, this is a great one. We're driving around. She's showing me locations. You got to remember, there's still people out there living in their the old sharecroppers and stuff. There's buildings out there that still have dirt floors. I mean, people are just kind of fixed in that way. 
Uh, anyway, she's telling me a story about this family that had one. That is a, uh, they have this group of smaller creatures that wander around. And uh, they said they had a better temperament. They seemed to be a little more friendly. And some people used to actually feed them. Well, she tells me a story about this one group. There's a bunch of homes together. They're sharecropping homes. And one of these things gets into a house, and they can't find it. It's hidden amongst the stuff in the house. So they, the community gets together. They end up, as she told me in the story, if you watch the video on my YouTube channel, you'll actually hear her say they set the house on fire. But what they really did was they actually smoked it out. And they smoke this thing. They get the house engulfed in smoke. And they have the front door open. When the thing comes out, they beat this thing to death. And so she's telling me the story. I said, you have to tell me that again. I need to film it. So I'm literally just filming her on my phone. And so after she tells me this, I'm saying, do you have any idea where they buried this? And she mentioned something about being a, like a Christian burial. They did a proper burial of it. And they, she didn't know. It was a story that was told to her by another woman. And uh, I was like, well, if we could zoom this, that would be huge. Find out what it is. I mean, was it really a creature? Was it? Was it murder? Was it a person they, you know, you know, a hairy person they killed? Uh, but the story after story that I was getting from people in the community that was just amazing. I mean, the blue eyes, the the the, the, the different sizes, uh, talking about the whistling to communicate. Uh, just you know, you didn't go in the woods at night back then. They people tell me back that's before we had air conditioning in the cars, and you drove back past those sections of woods down there. You could hear them communicating in the woods. You just didn't go in the woods at night. And to this day, I mean, even the hunters around here, for the most part, don't go out hunting. They use hunting dogs. And so these guys pretty much park by the side of the road. The dogs are let loose. Some have radio collars. And they basically chase the deer back out to the road. And that's where they dispatch the deer. But uh, it's uh, just, the stories are just nonstop. I've had some just amazing, amazing interviews I've gotten. And the best part is a lot of these are people who are not Bigfoot people. They see these things. And now they have a place to come and talk to. And a lot of the folks that talk to me do not want to be their names used, you know, deputy sheriffs, things like that. Do not want to be on camera. Um, are these like local people, like from your just general vicinity around Littleton? In the beginning, it was very local. Now we okay. get people from all over coming oh. in. You know, once you're on Travel Channel, you know, MTV, NPR, PBS, yeah. all that sort of stuff, and then all the local media. And the all the local, you know, like we don't have much right here as far as media. We're in the middle of nowhere. But Raleigh, Durham, you know, other, you know, Richmond newspapers have done pieces on us, local magazines. So the word gets out. And uh, a lot of the uh, local, even over by the shore, a couple of the radio stations are really good about promoting us, especially when we have events and just love getting us on to tell stories every time there's a recent sighting. Yeah, that's crazy. So when he was talking about these small ones, was he referring to younger Bigfoots or was he referring to another type of creature? What I got from them, they were talking about almost a separate type of creature. It was like mm -hmm. a group of, of like, you know, like, like dwarf Bigfoot. I don't know how, how you would do it, but they weren't the monsters. Where a lot of these other ones that we've gotten in the area, and I've sent some photos to you, some of the stuff we've got on thermal camera, are well into the eight, nine foot range. Well, these things never seem to get big. They apparently had a better disposition. They just were a little more, uh, I guess, friendly is the way to put it, more animal-like. They, they would come. They were able to feed them. Uh, one of the stories she told me was about this one house that she brought me to that actually had dirt floors. And she was afraid to go on the property because her husband wasn't there at the time. He knew them better. And it was a family that actually used to let this one in. And at the end of the night, they didn't want to get it out because they didn't want to leave it in for the night. And they would throw snuff under the you know the table or where it was, and it would make it sneeze, and the thing would leave, and they'd get it out the door that way. But now, it was this so is, that's crazy. Yeah. And do you believe? I mean, do you believe the story or no? I believe a lot of it. I really do. In the beginning, I was kind of skeptical. I mean, you know, it was it was a lot to take in. And at first, when people start bringing stories to you like this, you kind of you you, know, you want to question. But I'm a journalist. I'm used to dealing with you know. Yeah. You know, serial killers, mafia dons, you know, you know celebrities. <laughs> I mean, people tell stories. And yeah. uh, so I dealt with real crime, real stories out there. And now I'm dealing with this, you know, kind of basic folks, simple folks that are here to just all of a sudden. And you can see like uh, Jesse Walker is a perfect example. And he lived right across where the museum is located now on Moore Street. And that's about she has got to be three and a half years ago now. Uh, he was one o'clock in the afternoon. 
73 year old retired school teacher. Uh, he was going out to have lunch with his lady friend. He went in the backyard. They have a shared driveway, the two homes next to each other, to put something in the garbage can. He sees this creature in the woods behind his house and freaks out. Runs back to the car. She's trying to you know, get out of him. Like, what is the matter? He finally explains what's going on, what he saw, and just telling her, drive, drive. And she, he, she drove him to my house. At the time, it was the middle of COVID, so we were shut down as a museum, but I was a commissioner. And I hear my dogs bark. I go out front, and there's Jesse out front, and he's crying. I go out there and go, what is the matter? I'm thinking his cat got run over or something. He's going, ah, I saw a Bigfoot. And I bring him in, and I interview him. He cries through the interview. And that was that was another one that just went wild. I mean, of course, a lot of people, you know how it is, they harass people who come forward. And uh, but Jesse uh, now is actually I've had him come to some of our festivals and tell his story. And, uh, and you know, now you, you would talk to him, you think he's the uh, the big Bigfoot uh, researcher. But at the time, he was horrified when he saw this thing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's raw motion, and that's what I caught, and I love that. When yeah. you try to get someone, you get someone a year or two later, or worse yet, many years later, and the story's different than when it happened. I got him within minutes of him seeing this, and he was just uncontrollably upset. Wow. Alex, did um, Steve send you any stuff? I mean, you can throw stuff up at any point. Yeah, this is know. one I can, I, I'm not going to see it well, but this is one of the ones I think I sent you. I'm going to get all kinds of oh, bad cool. reflection. A thermal image we got out of Medoc Mountain State Park, and uh, that's probably I my moment. I want to see that thermal thing he's holding up, Alex. I Can saw you all kinds of stuff he's got to dig through. Can you find the uh, thermal? That's the inside of the museum. Some of the prints we've gotten, some of the creepy dolls. Do you, can you try to find that? Um, it's probably in the first right? batch I said. Yeah, this go, is go stuff. ahead. Go ahead and get rid of that scene. Get, get rid of the the share screen. So hold that up again, Steve. I could sure. see it. If you can see it, that was shot with a flare camera. Yep. Yeah. Which yeah, now we're using the AGMs, which are much, much better. I wish I had the AGMs back then. So what's the backstory on this? Okay. Well, now, this is another gentleman that was camping, Mr. Beaver, and he was uh, camping at Medoc Mountain State Park, and he reached out to me and told me he had uh, a group of three, he claimed, came into his campsite. Now, this guy is a Bigfooter. He was baiting and bringing things in. So he's in the, uh, a tent there, like an octagon-shaped tent. He's laying back. He's got a parabolic dish. And uh, he hears noise. He's been getting noise for days. He goes, now he's got his fire pretty much out. He's laying there. And the only real light he has in his campsite is one of these battery-operated bug lights hanging outside his tent. And he has a table laying up against a tree, folded up, a fold-up table. So the, now the uh, black light is illuminating the table. So he hears something coming through the leaves, and then it walks into the campsite, which is stones. So he hears it moving. So he's kind of freaked out. He's listening. And he's, he said he, that he's got a little hard of hearing now. So he's hearing better through the parabolic dish. But he's hearing this weird kind of ultrasound, sort of zing, zing sound, he says, as they were walking, like, almost like they were communicating. Well, they come into the campsite here, and now he can actually see, like, legs moving by the uh, white table, the fold-up table. Uh, so he's kind of freaked out. He says he can see, like, one smaller one and two definitely larger creatures there. So he's kind of just chilling. He thinks because of the black light, the bug light, reflecting on the screen of his octagon tent, that they can't see him. Uh, so at one point, one bends over right by the tent to look in, and it's so big. Now, his tent's tall enough where you could stand, like someone up to about six foot could stand in the tent. And this thing has to bend down to look into the tent, and he just freaks out and starts screaming, get away, get away, and all this. And all he, say, all he hears is gravel being kicked up as they run out of the campsite. So that was his experience, seeing these really large things come in. So he ends up reaching out to me, I believe it was the next day, and I go down to interview him, and he's talking to me, but he doesn't want to talk on camera. Uh, so I'm getting the story, and I can see he's emotionally upset. It's, it's something that obviously scared him. So we convince him to come back, and I finally able to record him and get an interview in the campsite. Now, he was willing to come back to the park and camp with us as a group, 
Uh, and it was a three-day camp out. As soon as he stayed with us, he wanted to stay with someone in the camp. So he didn't want to be by himself at this point. So we go out, we're doing some big footing and we get nothing night one. Night two, I'm out there and I forgot my thermal camera back at my camp and uh, I'm hearing some noise, but we're not getting anything phenomenal. Uh, the third night, a, a reporter came out. Uh, this uh, guy from the Daily Herald came out and wanted to do an interview and he didn't come out till later at night after his shift. He has an interest in this stuff anyway. So uh, he comes down, we go out in the forest, we go back to you know, an area behind the campsite down on Bluff Loop. Okay. And they go down to a low spot. And I hate being there because if anyone has gone into a, a spot like that, you can't tell where sound's coming from. It's I'd rather be a, above and high. And I've heard the story 50 times by now. So they're down there. They get the headlamps on. He's telling Rich, the, the uh, reporter, the story. And as he's going through this, I said, oh, I'm going to go back up the hill where I was hearing things last night. Now I've got a parabolic dish. I've got my thermal camera. I go back up so I can kind of almost hear them. I'm far enough away where I can see light from the uh, headlamps, but I'm you know away from them. So I'm listening with the parabolic dish, and up above me, I can hear movement. I hear noise. And it was, we have bear, we have deer, you know, wild pigs, everything around here, large cats. So I pick up the thermal camera. I'm looking, and in the distance, I can see something white hot. So yeah, an animal of some sort, I'm assuming. So I'm watching this thing. And then after a while between the trees, I can see it's upright. This thing's humanoid. So I'm going, hunter, camper, who's out there in the middle of the woods with no headlamp on? It's a moonless night. So I start taking pictures. I'm just firing shots off. If anyone's used a flare scout, you know, they're inherently slow. And, you know, there's not, they're not sports cameras. It's click, click. And if you want to do a video, you got to hold it down for like about eight, nine seconds. And you could miss whatever's going on. So that's why videos are kind of hard to happen. Anyway, so I'm taking pictures. And after a while, every once in a while between the trees, I can see the girth on this thing and the size of it. This thing is massive. It's got no light on. And even with a thermal camera, you can easily see clothes. I mean, belt line, shoes, shirt, anything, anything. Because basically, it's an insulin. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or, or like glasses, like I demonstrated. Exactly. You see glasses. And this um, thing Alex, was. Can you find that picture? And that was evenly yeah. lit. I mean, it Have was you just. Looked? So the thermal cam, any thermal cam stuff. Did you mail that to Alex? Yeah, I sent it, but it was in the first batch. I might be able to send it to you again. Let me see. Yeah, we'd love to. I'm all the, not the most up. technical guy in the that world. That looked but... pretty impressive. Um, I've never seen it before. Let me see if I can go into photos here quickly. Uh, your, your mic is off, Alex. Still off. We don't all right, I sent it again uh, via phone, so if that helps, I don't know if that expedites things again. Okay. Um yeah, I'll, I'll get it. But I just sent it to you again on the phone. So Sweet. I'd love to see it. So how many of these photos do you still have? I've got quite a few. I, this is, like I said, this is the Mona Lisa. This is the one clear one where there's no trees and stuff in the way. Yeah. Well, it'd be cool for me to see a bunch of sequential. Yeah, let me set, see if I have them in this file here. I can definitely send you the whole slew of them. Let me see what I've got here. And as everybody knows, thermal cam footage... Unless it was extremely close and detailed and good video, you know, actual video probably doesn't have a lot of scientific value. But um, I, Steve's the kind of person that I trust explicitly. And if he says, Yeah, I got he took, three here I can send you. So. Oh, cool. If he says he took thermal photos of this thing i know steve wasn't behind any kind of hope i have a, i have others but they're on one of the computers it's actually, it, actually my, let's well let's talk about how hard it would be to hoax a thermal you know to well, be the case, subject you couldn't wear a fur suit right right that wouldn't work well even i was interviewed by pbs i was showing up to him it comes out kind of comical but i told him this is either a really big naked camper or it's a bigfoot because it has no clothes on it's yeah. got that even lit to it i mean so it's a uh, it's the same temperature uh, you're going to see a couple in here where have you're going to see a little bit of difference because you see branches in the way. That's why I like this one because this one literally has nothing in front of it. It's yeah. the one shot I got with no trees in the way. So, but a lot of them were just you know, all you get is you can see heat. You couldn't even tell what it was. It's just yeah. light between trees. And for yeah. anybody in our radio audience who wants to check it out, just go to YouTube channel. And everything's on my YouTube episode, and and go to about the 45 minute mark and. 
you should be able to see these thermal photos. At first glance, it was pretty impressive because I know how hard it would be to fake anything thermal. What I hate is when I get thermal cameras where people claim they're Bigfoots, but there's no resemblance to a Bigfoot. That's what I like about this one. If you look at yeah. this, look at, the, look at the girth, look at the bent legs on it. Yeah, the bent legs. This is, are it's got no headlamp. Well, you can't tell a headlamp in the thermal. There's no headlamp there. This thing's walking through, and I can take you to this spot today. Some of the trees have changed because of storms coming through, but I can literally bring you within, you know, 30, 40 feet of where I stood and show you the hill where it's up where this thing crossed across. And I don't think it knew I was there, or if it did, it didn't care. It was interested in the guys down below making noise and talking because there was literally an interview going on. I think there were between the headlamps to chatter and Mr. Beaver being a little on the deaf side, talking very loud, I think it was bringing it in. And I was blacked out. I was dead quiet. And that's the way I prefer to go out. Is there a way to zoom in on that creature, Alex? I do have some closer ones. Love to just. Well, that's just light between the tree, but that's the same thing moving. This is pretty much what I got. That that's sort of almost looks like it's looking behind the tree. I mean, but this is just your, that's why I like the other ones so much better. These are just. Yeah, if you could blow up that you one. You use a lot of imagination on these. I wish I had the AGMs. I mean, the AGM scopes, I'm not, I don't sell them. I'm not promoting them, but. Is this another one? Yeah, that's the same that, thing. Can you blow that up bigger, Alex? Still the resolution on these enough. is so bad. No, I well, you people have to realize thermal cameras do not have good resolution. It's getting a little better, but you know, 350 pixels isn't too yeah, much. I know. Yeah, that's interesting. It's literally hot where it should be hot. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. his branches in the way. If you look at the other one, yeah. the full one, you yeah. can see. I mean, it's yeah, and I'll put the other one back, the first one we had up. Yeah, and see if you can zoom in on that one. Alex. And there's a horror story I can tell you. I almost deleted this. Flare scopes hate talking Perfect. to windows. Perfect. No, yep, there you go. See. Look, look at the one. look at the size of that body. That look is one scope. bulky. And we 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 judged it roughly eight and a half foot tall, going back up there and measuring the trees. So this thing is not small. This is not a you know. It's not a four foot, five foot creature. This is a large yeah. creature that had no problem walking through the forest at night. And at daytime, we've been up there walking around, setting up equipment. And we're falling in holes that are basically, you know, old stumps that rotted and stuff like that. So it's a rough area. It looks like it's, it almost looks like it's holding something. <laughs> Did you ever consider that? Yeah, not really, but it could be. That's funny. Something I saw on here is actually on my screen. <laughs> what do you think it could be holding? Well, it would be an infant. A baby. Or it could be food. Yeah. And this thing but, never came down the hill. But it, it whatever it is, is probably alive because it's warm. So I would probably, yeah, just say infant. Could be. You, are you talking about like here? Yeah, right. Yeah, that area. It is a little bit hotter there. Yeah, see, it's not. That's not an anatomically correct. That little part of it, um, the the you know, the, obviously the head is, the butt, the legs. Um, Look at the, the bend angle. on those legs. Okay, here, here's here's what, what the first thing I noticed is notice the one thin ankle, uh, the one that's farthest away. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely. And that could really, be vegetation in the way too. No, it, no, of course, but it looks very anatomically yep. correct. And you didn't, you didn't shoot any video of it. No, I literally got these shots and it was gone. Yeah, gotcha. I, I, that's the problem. And now, if we go out, we have multiple cameras now. So if you and I were out there, I would say, "I'll do stills, you do video." Gotcha. In the AGMs now, like when you push the button down, you, it just takes a few seconds for the video to start rolling. So yeah. there's less excuse not to do video. The flare scouts, they take forever. I mean, I could have missed everything trying to wait for the video to roll. And even taking the pictures, I was moving along the trail, and every once in a while, I, I'd go black. And I realized I stepped in front of a tree. So, so there's trees under the trail. So I'd have to quick adjust myself just to try to, you know, keep up with this thing. But it moved quickly across that hill, and it never came down. And then I'd lost it behind trees, and I think it went back up to the other side. Right. And at well, that Eric point, Eric Sorensen makes a point that maybe, you know, the eyes should obviously be glowing, but it may not be 
Yeah, but the uh, the these they don't get looking light. at us. Yeah, but they don't. You know, the the eyes are not gonna. Only if you had an IR camera is gonna give off light. These are detecting heat. No, no, he was talking about the, the, there's more heat loss in the eye sockets. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's a lot. And yeah, I don't think it's looking at us. Though. Yeah, yeah. So if it was looking at the camera, normally the eye areas are gonna be hotter. Um, yeah, I don't think this camera has the ability to pick up that. The others. Yeah, maybe. I would think, but you know, once again, I don't know. He's you still have you still have the camera. Oh yeah, well, like, and just, it's funny we take people out and they even, they hate to use it. <laughs> they, all right, we well, have the good one. They want the AGMs, you know. Well, here's what you do: go ahead, just get somebody, you know, however, whatever, whatever the distance was of this that you can estimate. They don't. They can just be regular person. Make sure they take their glasses off, and just see if you get hotter areas in the eyeballs with that camera. And let me know, and then we'll uh, I'll give yeah, we the audience an update on that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reading some of the comments. Well, here. we know he didn't fake it. It's just, is it misidentified? Is it? Um, yeah, this you is saw it walking. You saw it moving. So. Oh yeah. It was yeah. definitely alive and moving through the forest. Yeah. Like I said, I don't think it knew I was there. I never got a look where it looked like it turned and looked at me. It seemed to just keep on beelining towards oh, the noise. Oh, okay. So you're all right. So you're basically doing surveillance. Yeah, I'm being dead quiet. When I go out there, that's what I try to do. I'll bait. I'll put out maybe apples uh, or something like I that. You. Okay. I don't. I don't like to make. I don't. I don't like knocking trees. I really don't like making too much sound. And this worked for me. I mean, here I was being dead quiet, but someone else is making noise which worked to my favor because this thing went to that direction. And after I, this thing was gone visually for me, at that point, I'm trying to text them, say, like, something's coming your way. Uh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. David Ellis. Throw David Ellis's comment up, Alex. I know exactly what he's talking about. Look, oh, look at the glow good. around the waist. That could be an infant because infants are going to have a higher temp. Oh, I see. Yeah. I never even noticed that. It looks like a butt there, doesn't it? Yeah, do you see like the little butt and the legs wrapped around its waist? That's exactly yep. how they'd carry it. That's I was in like Crypticon a, a couple of years ago and I actually uh, sitting with, having breakfast with a moneymaker. And I showed him this. He goes, how come I've never seen this? It was like, good question. <laughs> Why hasn't this been published more? You know? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad to see this. And this it's was really... uh, 2020. I don't remember the exact date. What I'm I, really I... impressed with is are the legs, the, the huge bulk of those legs and the butt. and Yeah, no, it definitely looks anatomically right. Good job. Thank you, thank you. Good it was job, dumb luck. Steve. Good dumb job, luck. Steve. Good job. We need more. We need more. I would love to um, use this in Legimine Science. We're going to have a section on thermal cameras. Would you allow us to do that, maybe? Of course. Awesome. I'll send you everything I've got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send you even pictures of the different cameras we're using so you can show one against the other. I mean. Yeah. If you could do that, that um, get somebody to, you know, distance away and just have them look at the camera and see if your camera picks up the eye glow. Or yeah, the actually, heat, I'm hoping the to get down escaping. next week. I'll try it then. But, damn, that does look like I'm looking at this even more. Alex, can you, can you zoom in even more? Yeah, it just pixelates out so bad. Yeah, but I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at the glow and the shape of the glow. And yeah, it's definitely got a glow that would wrap around the waist and even a little foot, a little hump right above the butt where a foot would be. Yeah, yeah. You be honest with you guys, I didn't even look at that. I haven't noticed it. I love I just, a little yeah. when I when I found the baby grabbing, you know, actual video of a baby grabbing the Freeman creature and being lifted and wrapping around. Paul had never seen it either. Paul Freeman. Yeah. So sometimes it takes an extra set of eyes to, no, to you're look right. at stuff. And Fresh eyes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good job, man. This is awesome. I'm, I'm impressed. You didn't Paul even made... know what you had. Yeah. I almost, I, it's horrifying. I almost deleted this. Flare oh, cameras are terrible. I went back to my campsite. I, and I, I'm messing with the cables, and I, you know, it wouldn't read like as a jump drive or anything. It just wouldn't see anything. So mm -hmm. I, I literally left the campsite to come home because I knew I could see it on the scope. And I was trying to download, and I was talking to one of the guys in my group, George, who's a retired IT guy for state police. 
And uh, I'm like, what the hell? I'm going nuts. And I, I finally get some of the images down and I was downloading. And this is one of the ones I just didn't see. I'm going, I, I know I have some better shots. I'm only seeing a handful of images. And uh, later, I actually told the scope to delete, which thank God all it did was ignore. And eventually I plugged it into another laptop with a different cable. And all these images came up that I didn't even see the first time I tried. I thought I had them. So it was like a month later when I realized I had this image I almost lost and deleted. So that's when we, we really started looking into. That's when we, uh, uh, we got an AGM scope. And since then, we bought quite a few of them. <sighs> Yeah, David made another interest. Uh, Steve, David made another very interesting comment. So he says the temperature of the little one is a little warmer, and that would make sense to me. It seems to suggest two creatures. Isn't mm -hmm. it interesting? The best footage of Bigfoot involves mothers, yeah. mainly the Freeman footage. And we, I think, you know, I've definitely um, think the. Uh, Patterson creature is also post more post. God, I can't think today. Did she had, had a, a child, and she was distracting Bob and Roger by walking on in the open to distract them, to follow follow me right right away from her infant because um, uh, if she was postpartum also, that would explain her breasts because her breasts were definitely engorged. Patterson creature. So, yeah, it's an, really interesting because they just seem to come out in the open more when they're, when they've got young that they're trying to hide or move or who knows. It may have heard the other campers and it was trying to sneak away with the baby and you happen to be there to bust it. It's possible. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, yeah. No, it's inter interesting stuff. Super interesting. So, what other what other personal stories do you have with Bigfoot, Steve? Uh, personally, I've had uh, events there where people have called me and uh, had experiences, and I've gone up and followed up, and I found prints. Matter of fact, I mentioned this guy George who was here. Uh, George came out to visit the museum. Uh, it was basically around COVID time, so we were pretty much officially closed. But he told me he drove all the way out. So I said, "Well, come on in. I'll show you what I've got." And he ended up, uh, I gave him a map of the park and I showed him some of the hot spots. He went down and he actually ended up picking up, found some prints. He sends me a, a message later and says, do these look good? I'm going, yeah, where are these? Did you cast them? And he said, no. And then he showed me a picture of a snake and it was a toxic snake. So he made a, the proper move. He doesn't do snakes. So I, I said, where is this? And I ran down there. And it was starting to rain. It was drizzling. So by the time I got there, it was a series of, I believe he said five prints. When I got there, I could barely see three. And I ended up quick just setting up a tripod, putting my phone on it, and I documented what I got. And I was able to get one decent print out of the batch. And you can mm, still wow. see toes and stuff, and that's in the museum. And uh, I ran that story and actually Coast to Coast picked it up and ran it as a story. Did not an interview, but just a story on there talking about the, the gentleman from Delaware that came down. And, you know, so George's first time ever going Bigfooting finds prints. And we're actually able to cast one of them. And, uh, but since then, he's actually had a sighting there, and he has uh, actually a portal, too, which he actually got one time in the park. The park's a hotbed for activity. It's an old defunct volcano. Uh, one of the things we'll see there fairly often is orbs and with your naked eyes, and you can see them move between the trees. They kind of look like dinner plates, uh, off-whites, off yellows, kind of light kind of almost pale blues and this one will move between the trees and that kind of disappears and another one kind of appears now you know we assume it could be possibly paranormal activity but we, it is like i said it's a defunct volcano so there's a lot of quartz and crystals there and there's theories where the, the crystals could be rubbing against each other and creating static charges <clears throat> yeah well, that's so, yeah that's that's one of the explanations we don't know Exactly. And North Carolina is full of those things, you know, the brown yeah. mountain lights and all these things all over the place. Yeah. But um, these are the things you see with your eyes. So we've got some amazing things there. But one time I was not out. I got a tick bite about three years ago and I ended up with a Rocky Mounted Spot of Fever and Alpha Gal. So I was like all arthritic. I was in bad shape for a while. Hey, so, hey, I, I had that same thing. Oh, I did was you? Yeah. sick forever. Yeah, I'm still I, fighting. I got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever down in Belize. Um, by just literally just walking through the jungle every day and just uh, would take 
wood tick bites. Um, yeah, I can't eat or, beef or pork to this day. Oh man, that's that's like the worst thing ever. We'll have to talk about that someday. I'd love to sure. hear what your experience was with that disease. But uh, mine lasted. Uh, they finally kind of got rid of it because they can't really get rid of it. It's a little spirochete bacteria that burrows into yeah. your burrows into your nerve cells and hides. Yeah. And you can kind of beat it back, and your immune system usually keeps it, you know, suppressed. But man, if you get like your immune system drops, yep. that stuff comes back out and plays again. It's not fun. Yeah, I've got arthritis now. I never had before, so that's yeah, an issue. Because, so I'm trying to do some, you know, exercises just try because my yeah. you know, I will literally if I'm driving and hit it like a, a weavy road, like I was coming back from Lexington, Kentucky, through the mountains. And just hitting these roads like that, my shoulder was killing me for a week after that, just from the constant movement of the steering yeah. wheel. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Anyhow, where were we? We were talking about um, some of the uh, other stuff we've got in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's what's probably one of the craziest stories that you've heard? That's you know not you told us the one with the Native American, but from right. a different source. Is there well, another we had one? From a deputy sheriff that was uh, down the road from where the yeah, the house where I used to have the museum. Now I'm a commercial building up the road, and it's a small town. The town's barely a, you know like a mile wide, 650 people. Uh, Route four going down, which is heading down south towards where the park is and where the Hollow Opposite Pony. I mean, it gets the the uh, train drops there. Actually, the park itself floods where we're higher ground. Uh, well, anyway, it's a he's working a late night shift. It's a Warren County cop, and. Uh, He's driving down. Now, these are impoverished counties. We still don't have dash cameras, even on our town cars. But anyway, they're driving down the road, and he sees something large on the side of the road. Now, it's, you know, we're out in the middle of nowhere, so it's not like there's any traffic at, like, you know, 2 in the morning or whatever. I think, I think this is almost uh, uh, dawn when he was going in. But basically, he sees something on the side of the road. He stops. He's kind of watching it, and it kind of turns and looks at him. And then it stands up on two legs and walks off into the forest. So the hair in the back of his neck goes up. So he quick turns the headlights right directly on it and then slowly rolls up on with this area. And there was a dead deer on the side of the road. So he just felt it was feeding on the dead deer. Drove, came and saw me the next day. And I knew this gentleman. Does not want his name, did not want to be videotaped. Just tell me what he saw and how it freaked him out. But we get so many sightings like that. People come in and just have had, had experiences. Uh, another common thing we get now, this is kind of just generic, is people coming through the museum and you can tell they want to talk to you. They're kind of looking around and they're less interested in the museum and more trying to make eye contact with me. And they'll come over and then tell me a story about, you know, I've been married for 28 years. I'm going to tell you something I've never told my wife. When I was younger, I was out with my brother. We were hunting or fishing or whatever the story was. And they saw something, something that freaked them out. And they've never gone out hunting again. It's something that scared them to death. And that's a common common thread here. That's a common story we get. Uh, it's just over and over again. I mean, I, first thing I ask is like, you know, what time of the day? What time of the year? Uh, how big? What was the coloration looking like? Uh, can you show me the area on a map roughly where it is? And very common, it's usually near water, near one of the rivers around here. Like Fishing Creek's a big one that goes yep. through a lot of yep. sightings. Exactly. They seem to use that as their highway or an escape yep. to get across Agreed. it quickly. So you got to remember, I'm from Long Island, New York. And like I said, I mean, this is kind of new to me. I mean, I loved it. I was watch, you know, you know, these shows and see this stuff, but it was nothing in my own backyard like this. And I come down here and not, not, I did not move here because of it. I just, it was the right location for me at the time. Uh, a, a nice big house, cheap. Got me out of uh, Long Island, New York and ex you know, let me escape. And next thing you know, I'm in Bigfoot Central. And who knew? <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, it, you know, well, it's it's beautiful where you live, um, and uh, the <clears throat> the fact that um, you have hills, water, and forests. Yep. Just like and logging, logging's the business here. I mean, so I mean, there's just there's a little tiny town, and then miles and miles and miles, and a little tiny town. I mean, it's just I've driven people up. I had to pick up people at the airport. Uh, Ken Gearhart came out to do one of our uh, conventions. I picked him up at the uh, RDU, and I purposely drove him up uh, sort of the back way through Lewisburg. And he was just going like, wow, this is like Bigfoot Central. He couldn't believe it was just woods and woods and miles yeah. and miles. And we hit a little tiny town, and then it's just you know, another 20 yeah. miles and nothing but forest. Do, and, do you uh, find, have you ever um, studied uh, 
that the uh, most of the Bigfoot sighting, yes, happen near water, but they also happen where there's been forestry work done, mm -hmm. where it, where it's replanted. You yep. know, maybe twenty year old, thirty year old forests seem to be kind of a hot spot that I've noticed. You know, here in Minnesota, I don't know about you, um, or or are you having activity in these old growth type for? Gosh, I'm literally hiccuping now. Actually, some of the people that come through, it's not the loggers, it's the surveyors that go into virgin territory. And they're the ones that have to go in and figure out where the logging right. road is going to be, where the property lines are, that sort of stuff. And a lot of these guys are uh, like the hunt. A lot of them do squirreling. So they just carry like a 22 with them so they can kind of like just have fun while they're out there marking stuff out. And they're the ones that come in with the crazy stories because oh, they're okay. out pretty much by themselves. And they'll talk about hearing noises and trees being shaken and uh, things like that and being like, you know, something, you know, these guys do this for a living and they, they're, they're scared. I mean, next time he goes out there, he said he made sure it had a 10 millimeter on him. You know, the 22 wasn't going to cut it. He wanted to make sure he felt safe. And uh, but it's just so many stories here. And, and it's so many people that are just sincere. I mean, they have nothing to gain, everything in the world to lose by coming forward. And the bulk of them do not want to talk on camera. But no, it's it's um, so true. I have to drag stories out of people all the time, literally just drag them out. They want to tell somebody sometimes once they start talking. But, man, right. you know, because I'll like I'll ask everybody I know, have you ever had a Bigfoot sighting? Do you know anybody? And uh, it's pretty incredible. So what do you think these things are? What do you personally? Think I kind of still lean towards uh, flesh and blood. I mean, just because I'm finding the prints, but I could tell you stories about some of the guys that we I work with in my group, and uh, the you know, they've come back to me and said like I watched this thing move across, went behind some trees that weren't even big enough to hide this thing, and it was gone. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the area like, is there a hole there? Is it a, you know because there was gold mining you know tunnels and stuff around some of these areas, and but there's nothing there. There's no place for this thing to have gone. So how did it just disappear? How did it just blink out? So they kind of lean towards the interdimensional end. Personally, I kind of I haven't gone there yet, but I kind of I trust these guys. I understand what they're you know they're honest. They're you know they come back and they're uncomfortable. Is it, is it possible they're dropping and you know on their belly and crawling? Is it it's possible? It's like you know going by. Yeah, you know, I wasn't there, so these sightings that they've seen, it's like they they go behind some trees that are no more than like 10, 12 inches wide, and this thing's four times the size of that. It kind of walks behind and it's gone. And uh, I could show you something. Actually, I'll, I'll send it to you. This is not mine. It's, it's my buddy George's. And uh, these guys are, he's ex-cop, so they're into the body cams. Let me see if I can find this here for you. And sure. this is a, a portal, which I'm sure he won't mind me sending you. Alex? Keep you busy. Poor Alex is getting all this stuff. Alex? <laughs> Yeah. So I just sent you a portal. Now, this is on a body cam. Now, they're out there. It was a couple of guys. This is when I was in the thick of my tick bite and miserable, and I was, I was on all kinds of painkillers, so I wasn't going to go hiking at that point. Uh, they went out there. Uh, they had their thermal cameras. They had a, other, some other equipment with them, and all their equipment blanks out. They lose everything. And they're kind of like cussing, like, what the heck's going on? And uh, George mentioned something, and uh, Johnny says, oh, mine went out too. And they basically have to reboot everything. So not till later, they go through the body cams and he gets this frame. It's just like two frames, just a couple of, you know, seconds, not even, you know, probably a second worth of video. And you can see if you look at that, you can still see the bridge there that they're going across. You can see some wood and there's this weird sort of pattern, almost like almost like a light or a laser was poked at them. And it was whatever it was, was enough to knock out their equipment. Did they see it with their naked no, eyes? No, didn't see anything with their eyes. Oh, they just I gotcha. it went out. Gotcha. Not yeah, to later that he has to go through the the game. They they love the. I'm going towards the game cameras too. I just I, I'm not a big fan of GoPros, and the game cameras are just you get a decent game camera, you just turn it on and forget about it. You can worry about download. It just runs the whole time you're out there. We've kind of changed up our game as we've been out there more and more. We've you know. You know, like it's like just like the flares. I've gotten away from flare. Went with AGM. Right. We've gotten away from backpacks where we're in the chest packs now. We find they're better. You can still keep a gun in there and keep your scope. You can have all your other equipment. Uh, you know, just keep the basics there. You know, backpack. You constantly got to take the backpack off to get to it, or you ask, ask the guy next to you to dig into it. So if you're by yourself, you're making all this noise every time you're rustling for something. 
So um, uh, Hair Force brought up a good point. Um, do you think they're dangerous? Do you think they're not? I, I would consider them a wild animal and consider them dangerous. I don't think they're cuddly teddy bears. Yeah. There we go. Especially if you get between them and their young like any animal. Yeah. I mean, I don't go out there. I'm not out there to hurt one. I'm just out there to document. Uh, I like to bait. Uh, so I think if they know, if they do recognize me by my scent or something, they, and I don't, I'm don't, i not big on making a lot of noise. Uh, so uh, basically what if I'm you, out there. What do you I'm use sorry, for bait? What do you use for bait, Steve? Generally just apples. Yeah. I used to use apples and peanut butter, but generally I used to cut up the apples. I don't even bother now. I just take a bite out of the apples and I just lob them out there. And uh, we have the Piggly Wiggly in town, so it's uh, you know a little tiny supermarket. And uh, basically, I, they have, usually have some fruit that's discounted, which is you know really should probably be in the trash. Uh, so I'll just grab those because you know how apples are; they last forever in your car. So if I can get something that's starting to be a little bit on the ripe side, so it's more aromatic. So this so you can just you know, break them up a little bit, throw them around, or throw them against a tree. And this way you kind of leave the scent. And I'll try to do that uh, like a day or so before I'm out there for a couple of nights. And you bring everything in. You're going to bring in raccoons. You're going to bring in deer. But hopefully along with that, you bring in other stuff too. So. Yeah. Alex, he is definitely the New York researcher. I love it. I he just is. love it. Just a total. You're, you're just totally no BS. Just nuts what, that little bit of accent I have just, every time I ask for coffee. Oh yeah, here. just throw them <laughs> damn apples in the woods. Take a bite out of it. <laughs> I love it. Oh my god, that's just keep great. it simple. Keep it simple. Take a bite out of it. Just what did you? We got a piggly wiggly. Just throw them damn apples. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now you're awesome, Steve. Um, Alex, your turn. So. <laughs> if you hear it squeaking, that's my rescue dog on the couch in my office. Uh, oh, I rescue like dogs. That. I have a big old hunting dog in here. She was, uh, I, oh. I call her Christmas. She was rescued Christmas Day. So she's have you taken your dog? Have you taken your dog, Bigfoot? No, not yet, but she has gone on the road with me. I travel for the YouTube oh. channel, so she stays at motels and she travels well. Oh, she's God. a good girl, but she was starving and just abused. And yeah. She's come around now. Life's good. Anyhow. Do you want to give us a brief tour of the museum? Yeah, yeah. Let's do yeah, Sure. That yeah. print there is actually one of many. Those are not particularly large prints. Those came out of a, a different area. That was down by historic Halifax. And those were off uh, Cronky. Another river, though. Cronky Creek off J.S. Pope Road. I had a woman call me. And she actually called the wrong museum. She ended up calling uh, Halifax Historical Society. The dog's coming over now since I mentioned her name. And uh, the woman reaches out to me and says, do we have gorillas here? I said, no. What did you see? And she saw something that looked to her like a gorilla. And most of the hair coloring here tends to be dark, usually dark black, sometimes dark browns. And uh, but basically she sees this thing, basically dark black, very hokey, not real big. She thought it was around six foot tall under this bridge, walking through and uh, basically goes home, talks to her sister and her father. They went back. Now the thing's long gone, but they can see prints. And that's when the phone call was made to me. So I went there. It was late that day, and I wasn't able to go there. It was dark. So I met them first thing in the morning next day, and they met me at the bridge. And they actually were good enough to help pass things down because I had to go through grass as tall as me. And I got to tell you, I was uncomfortable going down there. I'm, usually things don't bug me, but I felt as if I was being watched. I did have a sidearm on, and I'm down there, and there's uh, this nasty water comes through. It's all farms in that area. And it's like, you know, this you know, broken glass there. There's a toilet thrown off the bridge. There's porcelain all over the place. It's not a place you're going to go, hey, let's take my shoes off and walk around, you know. Now, like I said, these prints weren't massive. But whatever it was, there's a little sandbar there. And whatever this was, was going in like a good two, two and a half inches deep. Came up out of the water, walked around this sandbar. There was an inverted stick stuck in. And then went back into the water and then to the other side of the bridge. I could see some prints there. I just cast the ones on this side, and at that point, I had like eight prints. I ran out of material and passed it up to them. You're making sure that you know, only one broke. I was lucky to get most of them out of there intact. But it was just very unnerving. Like I said, I, I usually don't get that creepy feel, but it was just strange down there. And uh, But 
that was just another another site. We've been back there a couple of times. People have called us in that area claiming to see things. Unfortunately, this is all I've gotten in that area. <laughs> And this is by historic Halifax, Cronky Creek, another what's, river. What's the length, Steve? On these, I'd have to go in the museum look on the card. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm going to say these are roughly about about 10 inches. Okay. Yeah. Eight, I say eight, but maybe it might be a little small. It might be closer to like nine inches on these. I, I don't remember the exact measurement off the top of my head. I just sent you a whole bunch of sorted photos. We have yeah, so the many. Only, I mean, it's really interesting. It's got huge toes, but it's got a yeah. narrow heel, which would probably indicated maybe human but it's 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 just one red flag that it could be human yep. and i got i got a whole series of these it was just whatever but, it was I, I was there now in my work shoes the next day and at the time this is before the tick bite so i was a lot heavier <laughs> i could still eat beef and uh, so i was at least 260 270 at the time and uh, i was barely going a quarter inch in and this thing was going in you know like i said easy two inches yeah. So this thing had to weigh a ton. And yeah, like, and no, it, 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 it looks there. like yeah. um, it looks crazy. I mean, the toes are massive. Yep. But the heel isn't broad, so that's that's just the one thing I want to point out. Yep. And it could have been a youngster. Who knows? You know. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, so you said it wasn't very big. Go to a new one. This is just the museum as it is now. We're still working on the place. We're, we're new to this building, relatively new. I'm going to have a whole UFO section in here. We have another room in the back we're going to make for to do small gatherings like book authors can come in, keynote speakers. There's some of the other prints. Now, the ones that aren't behind glass are copies. The ones to the glass next to it, actually, the, ones you, the one you just showed is part of that set there. I have a whole other case around the corner that has some really good ones in it. I think I sent you pictures of those too. And that's my Bigfoot statue. We had Mysteries in the Museum was coming out to do a piece on us because we have copies of Honey Island Swamp Monster prints. And a week before they're supposed to come, I was in touch with the host. I mean, this is going to be a big deal for us. We were still at the house at the time. So I sprung from my lungs and paid for that statue to be delivered. And it wasn't cheap. Now that's even more expensive, well over three grand. It was like three hundred fifty dollars for shipping. Or yellow freight still existed. They delivered it, and yeah, uh, they're they're not, trying to get that to shore. <laughs> yeah. I had a I had a big Bigfoot statue in my office here, and every time I came in, in the dark and like once in a while, I'd go whoop, yep. <laughs> jump. Well, this became the centerpiece, and uh, but uh, it was so we moved it to this museum. I twice now I had to squeeze this through a thirty six inch door, and it hasn't been easy. You got to turn it like a corkscrew to get it in. Takes two men and a small Anybody boy. To else, do it. Alex? You gotta keep it moving here. It looks huge. That's actually. Let me just put my glass on. Yeah, that's the print George got. That's one of the ones I actually cast. It was the one of the uh, out of the five prints he got. When I got there, there was only three that were even looked like prints, and that's the only one I got, which you can still see. It's over poured. I purposely did that to, to save it because of the rain. But you can see the toes in there. A little bit of dermal ridges, but not much. Is this one of your it's haunted dolls? dolls? Yeah, it's one of the dolls that makes yeah, people. It's, cool. it's on the way. He's already FedExed it to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have our doll, a rocking chair that rocks by itself. And we have the, those are mirrors that are covered, but both brought to us by different paranormal groups. The one that's actually uh, got the uh, altar cloth on it was actually of a group out of North Carolina that did a uh, cleansing that went didn't go well and they needed us to come in and help remove the mirror and the other one next or came from a paranormal group in gettysburg that drove it all the way down to us to have in the museum so yeah they wanted it out of their damn house yeah we get a lot of stuff they have a haunted hay crane which i don't know if it made in the photos haunted what a hay crane actually it's a crane that came out of uh granite falls in north carolina a family member hung themselves from the rope and the old hay cranes like hay now is uh bailed or rolled and it's kind of wrapped with plastic so they can kind of leave it in the field. In the old days, it was cut, and you had to pick it up and put it on a horse and buggy, and then it was lifted into a, a loft to keep it somewhat dry so you could feed the animals yeah. off-season. And it's one of those old cranes to lift it. You would have had the hoist sticking outside the building and wheeled it in. And, and this was inside a barn, and they found a relative hanging from it. Okay. Wanted, wanted to get rid of it. So we, we get a lot of weird stuff. Where, where in the world is your sign? You don't have any sign. Well, there's a sign on the side, and actually, it is up on there. You can't see it in there, but 
We're still working on the place. Steve There's Mason. a couple of signs. You just you, the signs at the far end. Is I took a picture to show you the uh, mural on the side. Uh, the mural is done pro bono from the uh, an artist in town, the uh, Frank's Gallery, which is phenomenal. They do all kinds of stuff, and they got the community together and actually uh, uh, had everyone come up and paint it. We had kids in the neighborhood, people. They kind of did a sketch work. It's kind of a paint by colors. Once they just kind of drew out the trees and stuff, we kind of just put like green here, little blobs of the color, and everyone painted it. Then the artist came in and kind of touched everything up. Huh. Interesting. Have you uh, seen a ghost? Yeah, actually, I got a ghost cat when I worked for the Daily News. I, I don't know if I sent that link to you, but it was this uh, the Shanley Hotel upstate New York. And I was just there doing a documentary and just, you know, you're expecting to get nothing. I'm going to interview the owner and the people that had stories there. And we did an investigation. Oh, oh. Did he lock up? <clears throat> the ghost just got him. <laughs> well, we actually got this thermal, uh, well, not thermal, but we had, uh, uh, we call it surveillance cameras up. And I bought it particular for that story. And it was, I believe it was 16 cameras. So I had 16 wired cameras back then, wired cameras all over the place. And he didn't want me to uh, use any kind of gaffer's tapes. So we had like little Velcro wire tires going up the stairs. It's a three-story building. So I had cameras everywhere. <clears throat> and about a month later, I'm trying to work on the video. And I literally get this crazy cat thing walking across the hallway. And uh, it was it was just nuts. I could try sending it to you if you guys want to see it. Sure. It's on the if, you just, if you type in ghost cat, and even just my name, it will come up on YouTube. It gets it gets so many hits. So how do you know it's a ghost, not a real cat? Well, because uh, the cat died three years ago, and I didn't even know anything oh. about the cat. After you, you see it, you'll be to tell. You can only see the ass end of a cat. It was pretty crazy. All right. And I was still working for the Daily News at the time, so this was huge. New York Daily News catches a Shanley Hotel ghost cat. You might be able to pull it up quicker than I can find it and send it and link to you. Ghost cat. It's gonna be like a black and white image, you know, regular night vision mm -hmm. sort of stuff. I had a cat. Yep. Was 13, 14 years, and when I had lived in the other house, I used to let the cat out at night, and the cat would come back during the day. But when we, when I moved into the hotel, the cat refused to go out, and I couldn't get the cat to come into my apartment. For some reason, the cat wouldn't come into that room, and the minute I bring it into the room, she take right out the door. So I started feeding her outside in the hallway. And she would roam the building. Then after a while, she started going up to the third floor. And she would come down to the second floor, she would eat, and she'd go back up to the third floor. Then after a couple of months, she refused to come down off the third floor. And she would stay in Claire's room. And we picked up an EVP one night of Claire saying that it was her cat. Now you see this thing cross at the end of the hallway. Then we zoom in. But look at that. It's just all right. We need a cat. Is that crazy? It looks like a tail. Yeah, it's like the back, the butt, the back legs. If you can rewind butt. just that last part. Look, put put that back. I just want to see the. You can cat. just get the the end of it. Just, just show us the very end. Ain't that? Yeah, poor Sal's passed away years ago. And who filmed this? I did. It was actually it was done on a surveillance camera. So I had I literally had 16 cameras filming all over the place. I wish we could slow it down. Oh well, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a Alex. Everyone... She's going to ship you the ghost cat too. <laughs> You're getting the ghost cat and the doll. <laughs> and it comes from one room right into another, and that's the room. Now the story is Sal had an apartment on the second floor, so people come to ghost hunt. He had an old cat with him. The cat would no longer stay in his apartment and wander up and down the second floor and eventually went up to the third. And then it settled in Claire's room, which is the room at the end of the hallway, which is supposedly a woman who was murdered in that room. So he would check on the cat. It was inconvenient for him, but the cat wanted to be there. So that's where he would feed it. One day he went up there and the cat was dead. He was upset. He buries the cat out on the property. I show up three years later, do this documentary, and I catch this cat walking into the room where it was found dead with his happy cat tail. So this was huge. So I sent him what I caught. I said, I got something crazy on the third floor. And about 20 minutes later, Sal calls me back. He can hear the emotion in his voice. And he says, I can't believe you caught my cat. I said, what cat? Because he never told me anything about it. So I had to go back and interview him to talk about the cat. 
unless he had a spare cat. It was cat. huge for him. This brought Taps in, Kling Brothers. I mean, everybody went there after the Ghost Cat. So it was oh. really good for his business. There you go, Alex. All he needs is a Ghost Cat. Ghost the whole Cat. Whole world, yeah. will be cat. Whole, whole world will be to trail your door. <laughs> so all you need. No, it's, it's, it's interesting footage. Um, <clears throat> so, anyway, yeah, any questions before we... How about the Confederate soldier ghost photo? Is that something you took? Yeah, that's something we got. Uh, that's back at Medoc. We're getting ready to go bigfooting, and we caught something that was behind a tree, and it stepped oh. out, and it looked like a Confederate soldier, and then it backed off and disappeared. Wow. So, and Have that actually, you can, and that, that actually that will show you a thermal image. We can actually see strapping like a hat. Looks oh, really? Back on. I mean, that's that's kind of unique. And we found out later there was actually a uh, Confederate graves down in that area. So. so you filmed a ghost with a thermal cam? Yep, just picking up heat. Now, the, the claim on the thermal with the paranormal activity is when it's hot, it's supposed to be evil, which I kind of take with a grain of salt. I think energy is energy. I mean, I don't think you can you know, decide if something's you know, got evil intent by the temperature of it. But the weird thing about that, you were talking about eyes before. In that case, you can see the eyes are dark. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was um, reading about how people were using their Teslas that had um, IR and LiDAR radar, and they were parking in front of graveyards. Really? And watching dead people. <laughs> That's an expensive graveyards. ghost tool. <laughs> yeah. And apparently they changed the software so that doesn't work anymore. That's odd. Yeah, I thought that was a little different. It's apparently cheaper, the new technology. They reprogrammed oh, they reprogrammed all the people that had that because they do those air updates, I guess. You know, it just kind yeah. of comes in through the air. And uh, everybody lost their ghost hunting ability with their Teslas. So super interesting. Um, have you seen a ghost in real life though with your own eyes? Not with not with a camera. Not with yeah, I, I've actually, I, I would say I saw one thing when I first moved down to the old house, the old historic house in Littleton. I was down here by myself. And a, like I said, it's an underground stream in the house. There's a stream that runs through the backyard. And the house used to be a boarding house at one time. There's a lot of stories about it. They said there might have been even sex workers in there, which is apparently common in boarding houses. It's on the old stagecoach road. So, but I, I have to take that as just a story. Uh, I'm outside. I'm literally mowing the property. I would come down from New York and I would try to maintain and do what I was doing for like a week or so. By then I had to go back up north. I was still working part time for the Daily News. And uh, I'm out there just pushing. I literally had a push mower, not even self-propelled. I'm just trying to keep the grass down so it looks like someone's living there. I'm back out by the stream and I'm mowing. And we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. And I look up and standing on my property, probably around maybe 50 feet away, looks like a farmer with coveralls, just kind of gray hair, kind of staring at me. And my mower is making lots of noise. I just look over to him. So one second, I figured it's a neighbor. I don't know everybody at this point. I turn the mower around and the mowers these days, you have that bar you got to hold down. So you let go of the bar and it disengages and shuts off. I turn around, guy's gone. It's like, what the hell? I just saw this guy, you know? So it's kind of weird. So I walk out to the road now because I have some trees in the back. I have this back property. Then I look down. I don't see this guy. It's like, how fast is this guy? Where'd he go? And it kind of bothered me. It's like, you know, I know I just saw this guy. I just waved to him. So I kind of walk around a little bit. I go back to mowing, doing my thing. It's like, you know, kind of second guessing myself. I remember calling my wife that night and saying, I swear to God, I saw this guy in the backyard. Now, I'm down here by myself, and you know how it is if you're working on a place and you're by yourself, you tend to have weird hours. So I'm living off pretty much, you know, frozen pizza and beer. So I kind of wrote it off to that. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm just not sleeping well, but I swear to God, I mean, I. That's, I, I, that's all Alex does. He just eats frozen <laughs> pizza. And I can't beer. say for sure it was paranormal, but man, that was my I, diet I swear. Today. But we, we would see weird things in the house. And like I said, my wife's one that was not into this, and she swears she's seen things in the house. And, my youngest daughter hated to stay there because of stuff happening. And uh, so it's just, you know. Did you ever hear, I think the creepiest ghost stories, and I hear them more often than I should, of people having a long conversation with somebody, and then they'll tell a friend, oh, I was just ran into JoJo over at the 
yeah. coffee shop and we we're talking for an hour and they go, Jojo's been dead for two weeks. Yep. I've heard, I just hear that all the time. Um, uh, those are incredible stories. If you talk to emergency workers too, people in the ambulance service, nurses, doctors, they all have stories to tell. Everyone's had an experience. If they want to talk about it, that's a whole nother thing. In hospitals. Yeah, hospitals or even people that do, especially people that go to take care of people in their home, hospice and things like that. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like the people come back to say thank you or say goodbye, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, Eric was telling me about he had seen his dog. Um, he walked by, I think it was, I think his story was he walked by the laundry room and there was his dog, but he just was already in motion, right? So he kind of saw the dog and he just kept walking and he backed up. Yeah. Like, what's my dog? You know, what's it doing in the lawn? And then it was gone. I never yeah. saw it. So fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, we got the ghost cat. It was amazing all the stuff we got online about it. Cats don't, animals don't have spirits and all this. I mean, it really dug up a whole bunch of people's feelings. And it was great for us as far as just getting hits on the website. But uh, it's, it's amazing. Well, I, I, I think work. you're so cool. Steve, would you, if you hear any good stories, can you just get a hold of us and come on and sure. just tell that story? You gotta love to. Keep us updated with your, your cool stories. Yeah, no problem. I'd love to. I, I, appreciate I just you guys love your me. style, man. I just, I just dig that. I love, when I go to New York, I just, I find it so refreshing. You know, if I go to New York or out east, even Pennsylvania, people are just like, they just tell it like it is, man. Yep. They're friendly. They're, um, I don't know. can't even explain it. I just I love it. But if you hear anything, just call us. Just say, Alex, i got a great story I want to tell. Sure. I'll get you in. I'll we'll squeeze you in. That'd be awesome. If you guys are over down this way, please come on by. We'll take you out. Well, I'm gonna, if I come, I'm going to bring you a big damn banner. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, we get some signage on the building. We just got to get need, there. Yeah, I don't think Littleton, you were, you were the mayor, right? Yeah, it was a, actually, I was commissioner first, uh, town commissioner. Actually, I don't know if I sent you a picture of my sign. I actually have a sign that says, Bigfoot says, vote for Steve Barcelo. Yeah, yeah, I did. I and, saw uh, that. I found it online. That's kind of funny. And uh, yeah. actually, I had some of the commissioners in town gave me a hard time for talking about Bigfoot, saying you're making us look silly talking about Bigfoot. I said, I'm just telling the story. I mean, you've got Bigfoot sightings. This is a big deal if we have the world's best tomatoes become the tomato capital. This is, you know. So yeah. anyway, so I ended up getting voted in. Not just once, but twice. But I was mayor pro tem, and the mayor stepped down. So that's why I was commissioner and mayor at the same time. Oh, so oh yeah. It's a non-paid job, so that's kind of what it was. Yeah, there you go. <coughs> oh, so awesome. those signs of people were stealing them left and right. Oh, my God. As soon as well, I put we them just, out. We need, to, we need to get you in, into the Senate next. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> at least that pays. <laughs> yeah, we need to get you in the Senate. That's awesome. Well, Good thanks, luck. everybody, and thank you um, for coming on. Um, definitely make sure you mail that doll and and yep. that uh, creepy, whatever whatever creepy, just put it in a box. Yeah, the one with that yeah. curse on it I need to get rid of. <laughs> so, anyhow, thank you, everybody in chat. It was a fun show. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Steve. We love everybody, and just remember, everybody, it's the tree that bends is that stronger than a rigid tree that breaks. So with that, we're out of here. Good night, everyone. I call you up in the middle of the night Been bothered by dreams, ain't feeling all right You give me comfort, say just give it some time By the end of our talk, I'm feeling just fine You and I will always know No